This is Audible. Audible Studios presents Mercury's Bane, Book One of the Earth Dawning series, written by Nick Webb, performed by Greg Tremblay. Prologue, September second, twenty sixty one. Near Denver, North American continent, Old Boulder refugee camp. You could always tell a Jovian from a Martian, and a Martian from a native. People who grew up outside the gravity well never seemed to be able to keep up. One's history with gravity was always the hardest thing to hide. Not much farther now. Thomas Pike hauled himself over a tumble of rock in the middle of the path, and held out a hand to the soldier scrambling up behind him, huffing and wheezing. To call this boy a soldier was a kindness. The kid couldn't be more than sixteen or seventeen. Dressed in a shapeless shirt and pants, an insignia stamped hastily onto one sleeve. And he was far too thin under the raggedy uniform. The soldier panted. He'd been struggling within minutes as they climbed into the foothills. Only momentum kept him going now. Momentum, and a dull, simmering anger that Thomas Pike understood all too well. He'd never seen someone so weak. Did Earth have a lower oxygen pressure than the stations? Higher gravity? The kid didn't offer an explanation, and Pike was afraid to ask. The thought of the habitats spinning endlessly through the solar system, through the darkness, in the darkness, breeding grounds for darkness, filled him with a fear so deep that he had no words for it. To live a whole life without wind or rain or sun. Pike hurried to catch up. They had to keep moving. The kid had pressed on without him, despite his breathless pant. The path's loose rocks crunched reassuringly under Pike's feet. This was his planet, humanity's home. He welcomed the rasp of the air in his lungs, scented with juniper, and the faint burn of the sun on the back of his neck. The storm in the mountains wouldn't reach them for a while yet. They climbed in silence now, for the sake of the young soldier who could spare no energy to talk. Pike listened to the boy's ragged breath and counted the steps until they finally rounded the bend. The kid gave a whistle. The Rockies rose to either side of them, peaks plunging into the churning clouds of the unseasonal storm. Below lay the camp, makeshift shacks and tents covered in camouflage. If someone looked very, very closely, they could see movement along the river, where natives cultivated crops among the trees. Huh, <laughs> natives. That's what the Jovian soldier kid had called them. To him, Thomas Pike, this was home. A light breeze, the first winds of the oncoming storm, rustled the trees, signaling to the workers tending the crops that it would soon be time to take shelter. Christina and Joanna were there now. Farming was a risky endeavor, but a necessary one. People gotta eat, aliens or no aliens. But growing crops wasn't nearly as risky as what he and the soldier had just done. Pike had agonized over the transmission to the rebellion. If those transmissions were caught in one of the sweeps, the camp would be gone within minutes. But what was the alternative? Scrabble for a half-life hidden in the shadows, afraid to show himself to the sky? Spend his days avoiding capture, all for living on his own planet? The familiar rage kindled deep within his chest. This planet was his birthright and he would see it returned to his children before he died. That was the promise he had made years ago, and Joanna. A hand on her round belly had agreed. They named the child Christina, and she had Joanna's black hair and Thomas's golden brown eyes. Then came William, and Joanna began to ask if they should take so many risks. Perhaps, she said, they should seek passage to Mars. Her sister was there, and said the sunsets were beautiful or the snowball moons of Jupiter, or even Mercury, live with the rollers. At least they had decent gravity, and mining was good, honest work. And there were rumors that the mines served the rebellion, too. If they only... In the end, he persuaded her to stay every time she asked. But she worried, constantly. He hadn't told her about the message to the rebellion. How could he? He pushed the guilt away and pointed into the distance. You can't see it today, but there's a base over there. He twisted to point toward a peak behind him. Come down through the peak with a notch and it's due west. The soldier nodded. 
He was scribbling notes on an ancient tablet computer he'd brought with him, and he took a picture of the peak for reference. For all the good it did. He looked back expectantly. If you follow along the mountains, you'll find more of their floating things. They're all up and down the range. We saw some coming in, and they almost looked like the aid ships. Aid ships? The kid paused, clearly trying to figure out where to start. Well, they're not supposed to help us, right? We're supposed to be self-sufficient. But the stations really aren't self-sufficient at all, and some of the Telestines know that. There's one, his name is Telerabim. He sends aid all the time. He argues for us in their parliament, too, and I don't care. The boy broke off, eyes wide. This alien. Tell Rabim, you say? He's not arguing for them to give Earth back, is he? Slowly, the boy shook his head. Then it doesn't matter what else he does. He can burn with the rest. The boy nodded, looked back to his computer. Right. Ah. Uh... The big floating ships, are they all labs? The thin hand was poised over the keyboard, and his eyes flicked up to meet his. Pike only shrugged. He hadn't gotten close enough to tell. Half floating island, half airship. The estates were massive. Some were a swarm of activity. Others simply floated up and down the mountain range, taking in the view. When one hovered above the camp, all activity ceased for those few days. They froze. Fearful mice hiding from the hawk in the sky. But the Telestines would not always be the predators. That would change. What kind is that one? The boy jerked his head. What? There isn't... Pike looked and did a double take. There, as the storm billowed over the peaks, he made it out at last. The heavy bow of an airship. His throat seemed to close. We have to get back to the camp. What? Why? That wasn't there this morning. Pike pushed his way back through the scrub brush toward the path. His mind was racing with calculations. Would he be seen on the path? Speed and the chance of being caught, or a slow, careful descent and the chance of the airship seeing the crop workers instead? His breath was coming short with fear. Where did it come from? I, I told you we saw it when we were coming in. The boy was running after him now. Slow down, I can't keep up. No time. Why didn't you say anything? Your message said they were here often. The boy was shaking his head. On the range, going up and down the range, not here in the foothills. Christina was at the crop fields, fourteen years old, in a growth spurt and always hungry. She would be doing her lessons as she tended the crops. Joanna had been adamant that the children continue learning, even if they had to work to keep the camp running. But Christina was wild and always had been. She would take any chance to slip out of the shelter of the trees and into the sunshine. He'd chided her for that, but not enough. He understood the yearning too well to yell at her when he should have, and now... Pike's fists clenched. He tossed a glance over his shoulder and stumbled. No. No, no. The airship had come alive with activity. Fighter ships were emerging from its top decks, rounded and sleek. They swirled like a flock of starlings, and then... No! He scrambled up, palms bleeding, and ran. The camp, the fields. This couldn't be happening. They had never been seen before. He had never sent a radio transmission before. Mr. Pike! Sir! The kid, however frail, had youth on his side. He caught up, reached out to grab Pike's arm. We can take some! What? We can take some of the camp! The kid was pale, his blue eyes terrified. Whoever's there, we can get them out of the shuttle and go. We have to get to the fields. There isn't time. The kid grabbed his arm and dragged him to a stop. Let go of me, or I swear to God I will kill you where you stand. There isn't time, the kid repeated. His grip was feverishly strong. We have to get the people from the camp and get out. My wife is at the fields. My daughter and your son is at the camp, right? The kid met his eyes. We can get them out, but not if we go for the fields. William, William could get out, and then Pike would go to warn the others. There was enough time to slip into the woods and make for the field, and the other settlement beyond that. Let's go. They pounded down the hill in a rising wind. 
It might have been his imagination, but the bigger ships always seemed to bring storms with them. Like the one over the mountains today. How had he not guessed what was coming? Pike swung around one of the trees, felt the skin come off his palm and didn't care. William. He had to get to William. A hollow boom echoed through him, and he felt the fire tear through the trees miles away. The fact that he could feel the heat from that far away could only mean one thing. His knees buckled with grief, and the kid hauled him up. Come on! Fire! His voice wasn't his own any longer. Fire! He couldn't find any other words. That's the fields! They haven't hit the camp yet! Run! Screams were beginning ahead of them. Pike ran, the impact jolting up through his legs. He couldn't feel his feet on the ground any longer. The screams were around him, piercing him, rising through the trees in a chorus. They burst into the camp in a dead sprint, the kid waving his arms for the shuttle. It was hovering as the rebellion soldiers shoved children into the hold desperately. One of them was trying to grab little William, hands up as the boy pointed a rifle directly at the soldier. You have to come with us. The soldier was pleading, her hands out to him. Her uniform showed bony wrists. Her eyes kept going to the Telestine airship overhead, menacing and low. My sister is at the fields. William, gangly, had every ounce of his mother's fierceness now. He backed away amidst the tents, eleven-year-old body shaking. My mom is there. Don't try to stop me. I, I have to go to them. They need our help. William. Thomas Pike's breath was coming in a gasp. He swayed as he made his way toward his son. Dad. William's face crumpled in relief. They're saying we have to leave the others and shh, it's okay. Only it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. He looked toward the fields and smelled the smoke on the breeze, rancid with both scorched earth and flesh. They were gone. Pike swallowed, looked back to his son, and lied. He poured everything left into this one lie, eyes fixed on his son's. There's another shuttle at the fields. He didn't look at the soldier whose shock would give him away. He stared into his son's eyes and prayed to every god he knew to make the boy believe him. Another explosion rocked the ground, and he held out his hand. You have to come, now, William. They already went. Your mother and Christina will meet us on the spaceship. William wavered. He looked to the fields and back to his father. They're safe? They're safe. Please, William. They'll want to make sure you got away too. Come on. William's shoulders slumped, the rifle dropped, and Pike thought he would collapse from relief. His legs shook as the soldier grabbed him to propel him into the hold of the ship. No. His voice was weak. He couldn't live with what was coming. I'll go. They didn't even listen. They shoved him toward the seat where William was strapping himself in, and Pike knelt on the floor and buried his face in his hands. The shuttle knocked everyone inside to the deck as it took off. Everyone, hold on! The pilot's voice was desperate. They're still focusing on the fields. We should be able to get out of here. What about the shuttle at the fields? William twisted in his seat. His hands closed on his father's shoulder. Dad? Dad? Did they said the Telestines are focusing on the fields. Did the shuttle get away? He could hardly breathe for the ache in his throat. Pike picked his face up. I'm sure they did. But this time the lie was not so successful. William's face went blank with betrayal, thin body rigid. You said there was a shuttle! His voice was rising. He tore at the straps holding him in place. You said there was a shuttle! He was on his father the next moment, bony fists flying. You said there was a shuttle! You said! You said! Pain exploded across Pike's eye, and he fought by instinct alone. The shuttle was swerving, and the two of them rolled, William all bony elbows and pure fury, and Pike hit the floor. The pain burst through him as his hands moved to block William's strikes. But the pain wasn't from any blow. It was in his gut, in his heart. Every shriek from his son pierced his soul. You said! William's voice was hysterical, his fists raining down on Pike's face. You! A soldier wrapped his arms around William and pulled him off. The shuttle was shaking. A patch of turbulence launched everyone several feet into the air. 
The side of William's head rammed straight into a corner of a storage bin above them. He fell to the floor, knocked out cold. One of the soldiers knelt next to him, scanning him with some sort of medical device. He'll be fine. We'll have to watch for concussion. Are you all right? The woman's face was scared. Her hands clasped his. Your eye is... Pike pushed her away and pulled himself up on the straps of the seat. He swayed as he made his way to the window. His fingers splayed there. The glass was cold on his forehead. One could hardly see the camp any longer. It melted into the slopes of the foothills. Even the Telestines hadn't noticed it yet. You couldn't miss the fields, though. Not as the fire consumed them. The trail of smoke was drifting in the wind, and beyond. Pike felt his breath catch. The fighters seemed to be dive-bombing at the camp, plummeting down and pulling up only at the last minute. He strained to see what they were doing. They were chasing people. His fingers clenched. The figures were tiny, and they were running desperately. And the Telestines were taunting them. They zoomed low overhead as the humans fled. They were toying with their prey before they killed. They were not just aliens. They were monsters. His mouth gaped in a silent sob, and he rolled his head to look away. Look away, so at least he wouldn't have to see the ruin of the camp. He could change nothing. He was powerless. All of this was unfolding because he had thought, briefly, that maybe he wasn't powerless. That maybe his little camp could provide intelligence to the rebellion, and maybe, just maybe, be the key to the victory of Earth's imminent war of liberation. The great war to come. A temporary delusion. Through the blur of tears, he could faintly see a massive ship hovering over Denver. Shining and beautiful in the afternoon sunlight. He wondered if the Telestines there knew of the attack on the camp. He wondered if any of them had volunteered. He looked back to his son's prone body on the floor of the shuttle. The boy's chest rose and fell slowly. When he woke, Pike knew he would be nursing a hatred that would take years to die, if it ever did. He was his father's son, after all. One day, Pike promised him silently, you'll understand. And I pray you can forgive me, because I'll never forgive myself. Chapter 1 September 25th, 2082 Jupiter Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point Command Center New Beginning Station These numbers can't be correct. Laura Walker, Admiral of the Exile Fleet, crossed her arms and frowned down at the printouts on the rickety table in front of her. A slight shudder shook the space station, which creaked and groaned in response. I double-checked them myself, Commander Ariana King grimaced, and this is a conservative estimate. If we expand it to those ships with minor problems, and those really should be checked over too, ma'am, it comes to twenty-two. We'll stick with the biggest problems for now. Walker tried to keep her face impassive as she shuffled the papers, checking the ship names. Jocasta, Valiant, Andromache, Intrepid, Pele. Some of them were frigates, mostly expendable insofar as anything in the fleet was expendable, but there were gunships and carriers on the list as well. The fleet was now precisely in the position she'd wished to avoid, forced to choose between defending the rebellion bases at Jupiter and defending the task force headed for Earth. Fifteen ships out of commission. This was not a good day. If she had one wish, she stopped that train of thought with a quick shake of her head. If she was going to wish for things, she wouldn't wish for a better fleet. She wouldn't wish for more reliable supply chains and shipyards and weaponry. She'd wish for Earth back. She'd wish for the Telestines to have died when their sun exploded, or, at the very least, for them to have struck out in any direction but the one they chose. The direction of Earth. She couldn't have any of those things. What she had was a fleet in desperate need of repair, and a shipyard that was only just starting to get up to speed on metal-rich mercury. It had taken five years to build the secret mines and shipyards, kept hidden from the Telestines only by mercury's intense glare of scattered sunlight. Rumor had it that the Telestines knew about them anyway, and allowed their construction as a show of hubris. Five years spent gathering up the last dregs of humanity, who still remembered aircraft carriers and NASA space shuttles and engineering 
finding the best new mines, and bringing them to build new ships, better than anything the Telestines would give them. If their luck held, those shipyards would give them a fleet that had a fighting chance against the Telestines, unlike their current rickety exile fleet. Admiral Walker, said Commander Larson from the sensor station across the command center. I picked up that blip again. It's just a momentary ping, but Jupiter's magnetic field is messing with the readings. Could be anything still. Could be anything. Don't let it out of your sight, Commander, and keep me apprised. Could be anything, she repeated in her mind, or it could be a Telestine fleet come to end the rebellion before it even got started. With any luck, it was just a cargo freighter, and Jupiter's insanely intense magnetic field was simply fooling their sensors, making it look like a massive Telestine fleet. With any luck, on the other hand, the balance of their luck over the past sixty years had been terrible. The hand they'd been dealt had given them the invasion of Earth. She wasn't going to count on luck coming to their aid now. She sorted the papers quickly and tapped on one stack. These four will handle here, she considered the rest and tapped at each in turn. These send to Io Station, these Sora Station at Ganymede. The last two we can't fix on any of our stations, she sighed and tapped the map. The planets circled in a sped-up simulation. Stationary and orbital defensive systems lit up in red. Her lips moved as she did a rough calculation in her head. Wait a week and plot a course for Venus. I should put Earth systems far enough out that it won't trigger anything. Our contact on Venus can get the ships up and running, or so he claims. Can we handle four ships here? King frowned. She pushed the thick braid of black hair back over her shoulder and thumbed through the papers. Not really? Yes, she murmured. And I thought Soros Station's engineering docks were out. They were. Several of the struts had broken, cutting the life support systems to the repair module. Whether it was space debris or sabotage remained to be seen, and Walker had sent one of her best representatives to make discreet inquiries. There were those, the current Secretary General of the United Nations being one, who believed humanity endangered itself with the rebellion. They were so afraid of the Telestine weaponry that they would gladly submit to a slow death on the stations instead. Sabotage had taken down at least one rebellion station, and it was the reason this one stayed hidden. To humanity, New Beginnings Station was abandoned, a relic of the Exodus. To the Telestines, who had named it, Walker still felt a surge of rage every time she had to speak the words, New Beginnings Station was just another human cage. She had thought their operations on Sora Station were hidden, but she must have been wrong. Everything will be operational soon, was all she said. Soon enough? Is there a better option? Walker looked up, her face cold. She was losing her patience. Commander King swallowed. No, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. I don't want you to be sorry. I want you to focus on making this fleet operational. Walker turned her gaze back to the map. The mission needed to launch tomorrow, and she needed to make sure Rebellion assets weren't vulnerable after it left. This mission was everything. Their best hope to get a leg up on the Telestines in the coming war. If she were wishing for things, she'd wish for their contact on Venus, an individual whose name she could not discover despite her best efforts, to get a reliable tap into the Telestine communications systems. They'd been working on it for three years and hadn't managed it yet. When they did, the Rebellion might be able to learn just how much the Telestines knew of their activities. In dark moments, Walker feared that the Telestines knew everything and that they tolerated the Rebellion because it was too weak for them to fear. With any luck, though, what their contact had just found would be useful enough on its own. It was called the Dawning. It was supposedly the key to every Telestine weapons array in the solar system, the answer to all of their prayers since the loss of Earth. A stunning development, really. It changed everything. They just had to get at it. What do you think it is? Commander King had caught her staring at the intelligence briefing. Hmm? Oh. Walker frowned. That the dawning existed seemed clear enough. Their source on Venus was absolutely sure. What it was, exactly was another matter. I assumed it was a chip of some sort. Plug and play. 
Something their engineers use when they want to do maintenance or whatever. That makes sense. King lifted a shoulder. I'd been wondering why anyone would make something like that. Seems like a risk. Every system has an access point. Walker smiled grimly. The smile faded quickly, however. Even Oz. In truth, their system had more than a few access points. The Exile fleet had only a few rickety stations and a couple of scattered bases to work with. They couldn't let civilian habitats be a target, and that meant they got the most remote and inhospitable of stations. Like their fleet, the Rebellion's homes were much repaired and chronically on the verge of breakdown. When she looked up, it was clear Commander King's thoughts had followed a different path. The woman was smiling. When she saw Walker frowning at her, her smile grew. We're going to get Earth back. It's actually going to happen. I can't believe it. It's like a dream, King said. I wish my parents could have lived to see this. They always hoped. Her voice broke and she cleared her throat. Sorry, ma'am. Walker said nothing. Anything she said might raise false hopes. She clasped her hands behind her back as she looked over the resource lists one last time. All right. Before you send the Jocosta for repairs, offload the fighters and... Transfer supplies to the station. Half of them will stay here, flying patrol. We'll keep the Isabel here, and the Valiant will take the rest of the Jocosta's fighters for the mission to Earth, and go on to Venus from there. You are sending a damaged ship on this mission? We aren't going to get him down to the surface with gunships. We need fighters taking the hits, so it has to be a carrier, and the Valiant has the largest hold. She looked over at King. And if we lose a carrier, I want it to be one that's already damaged. King paled. Her throat bobbed as she swallowed nervously. Walker's mouth tightened. No one liked to talk about the possibility of losing ships, and that squeamishness did nothing for them. Lives were lost in battle. Ships were destroyed. Bargains were struck. How could her officers not face that simple fact? Humanity had lost its home in the initial attack sixty years ago. The first resistance movements had been cut down like grass, a metaphor she only vaguely understood, and now humanity tore itself to pieces in the tiny floating cages they called space stations. More were going to be lost before this was over. Her people needed to prepare for that. It will be worth it, she reminded the commander, hating the necessity of the pep talk. It was difficult to inject any feeling into it anymore. For a chance like this, any of us should be glad to lay down our lives. King hesitated, but she knew better than to argue. She nodded wordlessly. Walker would accept that. She handed the stacks of ship repair materials to the commander and gave a decisive nod. Let's get this fleet fixed so we're ready to act as soon as we have the dawning. Yes, ma'am. King snapped a salute. Both women looked around as the station shuddered. The hull gave a screech of protest followed by the agonized squeal of the extending docking clamps. The phone on the table buzzed. Walker picked it up. Yes? Ma'am, Bill Pike is here, and the Secretary General is on the line for you. Walker let out a breath she hadn't known she was holding. Send Mr. Pike to the briefing room, and tell the Secretary General that I'll call him back, at my convenience. Which would be never, if she had her way. She despised that man. He was spineless and craven. He had the ear of far too many wealthy citizens. There were even a few within the rebellion who listened to his speeches on non-violence and non-antagonism. With luck, however, there she went, hoping for that elusive good luck again. She wouldn't need him ever again. She might not have a strong fleet, but if they could just get their hands on the dawning, they'd have a fighting chance. And if she got Bill Pike onto Earth... She knew he would not fail her. Of everyone she might call upon, Pike knew best what happened when you lost to the Telestines. Larson glanced over again. Ma'am, that ping just got a little bigger. And it's not just a single ship. Most likely two or three. A tingle went up her spine. They'd yet to have a major battle with the Telestines face to face, fleet to fleet. She'd been biding her time, waiting for the best moment but it looked like her luck might be running out. All ships on orange alert, she held Commander Larson in her steely gaze. Watch it, Mr. Larson, like a hawk. Chapter Two Jupiter, 
Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point. Freighter Agamemnon, New Beginning Station. You're sure you want to do this? Pyotr Rashinkov raised an eyebrow. Short, but unusually muscular. Blonde, with the pale, striking eyes of his Russian ancestry. He was an imposing man when he wanted to be. Right now, he looked skeptical instead. I'm sure. Bill Pike hoisted a bag over his shoulder, wincing slightly as the old scar on the side of his head and cheek ached. It always did when something changed. When he left behind people he cared about. She wouldn't have called me here if it wasn't important. Rachenkov snorted, giving her far too much credit. Revolutionaries think everything's important. His accent made its first appearance, which always seemed to happen when Rachenkov got angry, and he gave a shrug. Go. Go, if you want, go. But come back alive, duh. I don't have the time to train a new first mate. Pike smiled and clasped his captain's hand. Keep my berth open? You think there are so many people who want to join the cargo guilds? Criminals, all of them. Roshenkov waved a hand. Go. We'll be running the food shipment to Mercury like we planned. The Agamemnon, or Aggie, as they affectionately called it, had been at a scheduled stop on Europa when Laura Walker contacted Pike. The ship's engineer, Howie Howe, was still back on Europa, getting the ice shipment ready for loading into the Aggie's cargo bay, while the captain had offered to bring Pike to the Rebellion's new beginning station himself. Despite his contempt, Pike knew he was curious. I'm sure they'd let you look around if you wanted. A smile tugged at his lips. I don't want, Rechenkov said, prickly to the last. Go. I'll see you soon. Pike waved and ducked awkwardly out of the Aggie's cockpit. Come back, guapo. He grinned and turned to face the purple-haired woman working on the water recycler, sitting cross-legged on the floor. Calling me guapo with your husband in the same room? Guapo. Handsome, hot, whatever. He still couldn't pick up half of the Spanish Gabi threw at him. From the air duct above them came another voice. Guapo! You should hear what she calls me, Gordito, little fatty. James Carson, Gabby's husband, popped his grimy head down through the open vent. It was literally the first time Pike had seen the other man without his cowboy hat on. Just remember, she only insults the one she likes. Right, honey? That's right, Phil. Pike grinned. He knew that one. Ugly. Hey, Pike? James's face turned serious even though it was hanging upside down out of the vent. Be careful. Don't let her, you know, just don't throw away your life like, well, just be careful. Got a cowboy? I know. Pike forced a smile. He didn't, no, but Laura Walker had given him a chance at something he'd been longing for, a chance he simply could not turn down. Bye. Say goodbye to Howie for me. And turning back to Gabriella. Hasta luego, baby, she smirked. It's hasta la vista, baby. But her smirk turned to a wistful smile. Stay safe. See you soon. Minutes later, he was escorted through the hallways of the station by two young rebellion soldiers. Very, very young. Almost as young as that soldier, twenty-four years ago, that had been the harbinger of doom for his old settlement camp and his family. He pushed the uncomfortable thought aside and focused on the station. It was built in the old style, a raised lip at the bottom of each doorway, heavy doors resting against the walls and ready to create a makeshift airlock at any moment. It had held some of the first shocked refugees from Earth. Thousands had been sent to the hastily constructed, massive stations around Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, as well as the first underground tunnels on Mars, Ganymede and Callisto, and the Dark Holes, burrowed into the concrete hard ice of Europa, far away from Jupiter's intense radiation. Thousands more had died in the airless dark. Life support malfunctions, orbital decays, debris that tore away solar panels and shattered radiation shields. This particular station had survived, but the civilians had long since fled. He thought the station had been decommissioned, doubtless the Telestines did as well. He wondered who had saved it for Walker to turn into the Rebellion's headquarters. He wondered what she thought of it. Did the rusted walls, the hurried, desperate construction, remind her of why they were here? Did she hope it would inspire the others? 
Pike wasn't one to think that way, but Walker made him wonder things like that. He followed the two young men through the boxy corridors and did his best to ignore the stares of the other soldiers passing by. Years on Earth, with fresh food and sunlight, had given him a broad-shouldered height rarely seen out in the stations. His patched-together clothing looked shabby next to their slate-gray uniforms. The young men stopped suddenly at a nondescript door. One of them rapped on it sharply. Come! Walker's voice sounded clear and commanding. They stepped aside and gestured. Admiral Walker is inside, sir. Admiral Walker. Thank you. He opened the door and entered. Walker had been in muttered conversation with two other uniformed members of the fleet, but she looked up and smiled as he entered. The smile transformed her. The years had not been easy on any of them. Gray already streaked her dark hair, and there were lines around her eyes. Even the UV lamps they used to stay healthy couldn't keep the tinge of gray out of her brown skin. When she smiled, he saw exhaustion in her eyes, along with the fleeting glimpse of the child she'd once been on Ganymede Station. He could see her now, hanging upside down in the zero-G, telling stories of ship battles and victories only she could see. Mind like a steel trap, a few people had murmured. An instinct for the fight, she might be the one to, best not to say it. No one ever said it, not back then. When he and Walker were young, the rebellion had been hopes and dreams. Two ships and a handful of soldiers with bars sewn on their standard-issue clothes. But Walker and the rebellion, or in some circles, those crazy bastards, had built a fleet from wrecks and scrap metal, making full use of humanity's penchant for turning anything into a weapon. And Pike, Pike still dreamed of Earth. He would have followed anyone who promised him skies and mountains again. In the meantime, he settled for life aboard a cargo hauler. It was cramped and the food wasn't great, but it was better than dying in the hopelessness and squalor of the outer stations, which was really all he could afford. Mars was out of the question. Venus? A pipe dream. Plus, people got all weird when they found out he was from Earth, that he was a native. Rashenkov was the only man who'd ever shrugged his shoulders. As long as Pike didn't steal, or crash the ship, the captain didn't give a damn. Pike! Walker's voice called him back, her voice, and that smile. Walker? He couldn't keep from smiling back. One of the soldiers looked sharply at him. Uh, Admiral, Walker, he corrected himself. No need for protocol. You are not one of my soldiers. She ignored the other's looks and beckoned him to the table. Come see. A star chart moved slowly through the revolution of the planets before breaking off with a burst of static and returning to the start. Pike's eyes followed the progression of a single dot, tracing its way out of Jupiter's orbit, swinging wide to gravity sling around Mars, and he swallowed, stopping at Earth. As a mission, Walker's voice seemed to come from very far away. We need to retrieve something from Earth. Earth. He didn't answer. He couldn't quite remember how to speak. Pike. She slid a printout across the desk. This is what we're going for. He didn't care, but he picked it up. His eyes tracked over the words three times until he could make sense of them. Why is it called the dawning? To be honest, we don't know. She folded her arms. We just know the laboratory is somewhere near a mountain range. The uh, Rockies? One eyebrow rose at the name. Colorado, Pike murmured. You know where it is? You could find them. I grew up there, and they're hard to miss. Walker grinned at that, and one of the other commanders cleared his throat loudly. We need your first-hand knowledge to make this mission a success. There was the faint bitterness there that Pike had become familiar with over the years. Those who had grown up in the stations never liked to talk about Earth, especially the ones who'd seen it. For some reason, the people on Mars and Mercury and the Snowballs didn't have that problem, but station folk? You never talk Earth with a station dweller. The man's eyes swept over him coldly. You brief our mission specialist. Pike will be the mission specialist, Walker interrupted her commander calmly. She smiled at him, and then at Pike. Ma'am. With all due respect, he's not a member of the fleet. I'm aware of that. However, 
He has first-hand knowledge of the terrain. He won't require any medical enhancements to compensate for the gravity. He has been fully vetted, and he has experience with weapons. He is not a member of the fleet. The commander leaned across the table, whispering as if the rest of the room would not be able to hear them. I'm aware of that, Walker repeated. There was an edge in her voice now. Dismiss, Commander. Her eyes swept around the room. All of you are dismissed. They left, some more eagerly than others, and Pike studied the ceiling to avoid looking any of them in the eye. When they were gone, Walker sighed. Pike, you don't have to do this. You can be mission specialist if- I'll do it. You sure? If it's where you grew up, the rebellion cell you'll be interacting with might be very close to where- Her voice trailed off and then strengthened. To where your family died, she said simply. He swallowed. He hadn't thought of that day in years, but he had thought of Earth. He had thought of the wind and the grass, the buzz of cicadas. He had thought of the breathless scramble up into the foothills on summer days. Technically, my dad died on Johnson Station. He tried to grin. She wasn't buying it. Bill, she began. I'll do it, he said again. When do we leave? Two days. We're waiting for confirmation on the drop point. We'll need to escort you in and provide cover for the landing. She smiled wryly. If only we already had the dawning, right? We could make quick work of the whole alien fugger fleet, she added, using the semi-vulgar nickname one used for the Telestines in the presence of children, which, in space on the overcrowded stations, were ever-present. And since they hadn't seen each other since they were children, it seemed appropriate. And the Telestines? He raised his eyebrows. What about their orbital defenses? This won't be a cakewalk. I've made cargo runs for the Fuggers before, and I've run stuff under their noses. Let's just say they don't take kindly to human ships over Earth. They kind of have laws about it. We're ready for them. You say you are, but are you prepared for the consequences? Her gaze was almost cold. We will lose ships and people, but this is our chance, Pike. Our chance to change, well, Everything. His lips twitched, but his eyes were already fixed back on the mission map. He traced the ship's progress to Earth, and hoped his death grip on the table wasn't too obvious. He was going home. After twenty-four years, he was finally going home. Chapter 3 Jupiter, Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point Command Center, New Beginning Station we need to draw the Telestines' attention to let our fleet get to Earth before they can mobilize a defense. Walker raised her hand to point at several glowing dots on the screens in the war room. One of the screens flickered madly, and she couldn't bring herself to feel anything beyond weary acceptance. Something was always breaking down here. The rebellion needed mechanics. And plumbers, welders, and construction workers. She reminded herself, again, not to wish for what she couldn't have. If this plan worked, she would have more than she had ever dreamed. The scout ships are going ahead. She nodded at two blue dots entering the asteroid belt, then tapped several red dots. These locations likely have sensor arrays. If we knock out this one and create a diversion, more on that in a moment, we should be able to get the task force through without being seen. Commander King, do you have a progress report? King winced and shook her head. Nothing yet, but it'll take them a while to cross the asteroid belt. Everything we've mapped so far on this trip aligns with what we've heard from the transport ships, and we've been able to avoid a few sensor arrays we might not have spotted. Walker nodded in satisfaction. Ten years back, the rest of the rebellion leadership at Jupiter and Mars had told Walker not to bother seeking out agents within the other colonies. Those with enough fire to be loyal would always find their way to the cause, General Essa had said. No unnecessary risks were to be taken. The rest had agreed with him. The rest, save those in this room today. Lieutenant Commander Scott Larson had grown up with her on Johnson Station. Commander Delaney, already cast aside by General Essa as too old, had remembered the old militaries of Earth. And his dreams of the planet he had seen with his own eyes stoked Walker's resolve. Commander King, young and overlooked, had backed Walker time and again in increasingly bitter disputes. 
There had been others, of course. Men and women whose resolve could not hold, who were not willing to give everything to the rebellion. Men and women who did not seem to care that humanity lay shattered and chained and starving, scattered throughout the solar system. They were gone now. She should be happy. The rebellion was what she had made it. Every success, however, had only been a thorn in her side. Guns, ships, uniforms, even air brought to them through a wildly inhospitable environment. None of these were victories she should have to win. She closed her eyes and tried to drive all of that from her mind. They were close to their target now, but that was no excuse for nostalgia. She should focus on the mission. Admiral? Commander Larson's raised voice interrupted her brief reverie. That blip from earlier, I've resolved it. It's Telestine, all right. A small task force, four ships. Her spine stiffened again. Course. He paused, working out the trajectories and numbers. Not aiming directly at us. He looked up with a note of fear in his eyes. But, close enough. She sprang into action. Red alert. Larson, if they were to adjust course and come here, what's the ETA? At their speed? Five minutes, tops. Not enough time. Damn it. She pressed the button on the command station that would link her into every Exile fleet ship docked at New Beginnings. All ships, depart immediately. Don't wait for your captains or crew members if they're on station. Leave now. Commander Larson will feed you a course. Keep the station in between you and the incoming Telestine fleet at all times, and then swing around Jupiter. Aim for the North Magnetic Pole. That should shield you from their sensors. Go! She glanced around at the captains and leaders of her fleet assembled in the command center. There was no time for them to get to their ships. The crews were on their own. The Telestines had caught them with their pants down. Never again, she resolved to herself. Minutes later, Larson confirmed. Ships are away, Admiral. Our shuttles are humming and waiting for us if we need to bug out, said King. Walker nodded. Not yet. There was still the chance this Telestine task force was just on a routine patrol and not on a preemptive strike mission. Oh dear. For now, Larson, track that task force with every passive sensor we've got. No radar. We don't want to tip our hand and blow our cover. We're supposed to be an abandoned station, after all. The minutes passed, and a deadly silence had descended over the command center. The assembled fleet officers, powerless to do anything other than wait, stood and watched Walker and her crew monitor the incoming threat. Any course change, Larson? He shook his head. Not yet, ma'am. Another five minutes. The tension in the room was palpable. Walker felt she could have cut it with a knife, but the stakes were high, as high as they'd ever been. They were on the cusp of launching the most important mission ever undertaken. If the Telestines wanted to cause the most damage to nip the rebellion in the bud, now was the time. If this was a preemptive strike, how the hell did they know? Larson looked up, the color beginning to drain from his face. Ma'am, they've changed course. Chapter 4 Jupiter Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point Command Center, New Beginning Station Walker sprang into action. Everyone to the shuttles, now! The command center erupted in a flurry of motion. This was the moment they'd drilled and trained for, but it wasn't going down as any had planned. They'd trained for battle, not immediate retreat. If this was an invasion, it meant they had a leak, a plant. Someone who had betrayed them. The command center was half empty when Larson called out again. Admiral! Their course change! He stared at his console, poring over the numbers. Guess? Her hand had been poised over the comm button, ready to send out a pre-recorded message to her contact on Venus. The one who'd given her the critical information about the dawning. The one who'd helped her stand up and fund the new operations on Mercury. The pre-recorded message said simply, We've been discovered and we're evacuating. Go to ground, cease all comm traffic. We'll resurface and regroup where we discussed earlier. They changed course, but their new course is not toward us. He looked up, relieved. Looks like they're aiming to pass by Io, with about a hundred thousand kilometers to spare. She relaxed, though not completely. Stand down, alert. Cancel shuttle launches. Recall the fleet when the Telestine task force has passed. She breathed deeply. 
not realizing how long she'd been holding her breath. Looks like Pike gets his chance after all. She looked around at everyone composing themselves after the near miss. People, if this mission succeeds, if we obtain the dawning, it's the beginning of the end for the Telestines, and the first step in our final victory. I still don't think Mr. Pike was the best choice for this. Commander Jack Delaney settled back in his chair and studied Walker, his old wrinkled forehead growing deep furrows. He had been with her from the start, but lately it seemed that nothing she planned was acceptable to him. Pike knows Earth, Walker said simply. So do I. The words came through gritted teeth. Delaney had been eight years old when the invasion came. He had survived the first exodus and the filth and despair of the earliest settlements. No matter how he tried to mask it, Walker caught the bitterness in his tone when he asked why the younger generation fought for a planet they had never seen. She never answered him when he asked. It would be too risky. For all his bluster, Delaney had a quick mind and a legendary skill for strategy. Anything Walker said might betray her. She could not risk him discovering her true intentions and motivations, which she would never admit to another living soul until it was all over. Humanity safe. Pike was born and raised in the Rockies, she said patiently now. He knows where the Telestines have bases. Well, they had bases twenty years ago. And he can survive without supplies, Walker continued. She did not bother to raise her voice. He was trained to use guns since he could hold one. We just have to get him onto the surface. She stared Delaney down until he swallowed and looked away. He could see the look in her eyes. He knew she wasn't going to entrust this mission to a man past seventy. His hair white. A man who'd never held a gun until fifteen years ago. For a moment she felt a stab of pity. But not everyone was made to be a soldier. And dreaming of glory in battle was not worth more than victory. Any other questions? Walker swept her eyes over the group. There was a hasty murmur, some heads shaking, and for a moment, just one, she felt a wave of regret. She understood why so few questioned her. After all, her rise to power had been as careful as it was ruthless. She started with the cargo haulers, against General Essa's express wishes. Walker knew what too much knowledge could do to a person and the transports that carried goods between the stations and the colonies had seen it all, from the palatial estates above Venus down to the worst of the stations surrounding Jupiter. They were the ones stopped for the petty indignities of ship inspections by both human and Telestine bureaucrats alike. They passed Earth time and again, a forbidden home, and they looked down at the blues and greens and knew it was forever lost to them. It hadn't taken much for them to start turning over their data on the obstacles within the asteroid belt, or the patrol schedules of the Telestine ships around Earth, or the questions that betrayed just where the Telestines were watching for threats. When missions were suggested, it was Walker who knew which systems to avoid and which to target. It was Walker who could predict the defensive capabilities of the satellites in orbit around Earth. Her power within the rebellion grew as she anticipated Essa's mistakes. When Essa fell at last, it was Walker who courted the youngest among the cargo fleet. Their parents, long since accustomed to passing the rebellion intelligence, accepted the trade. Send their children to the rebellion, and they received the promise of Earth in return. The new recruits brought with them contacts within the manufacturing sector, linked, however distantly, to the mines and shipyards on Mercury. When the rebellion's ranks swelled and its fortunes rose, the officers knew who had brought them so far. It was Walker who stepped into Essa's shoes, and Walker who now commanded the exile fleet. King and Delaney questioned her, but rarely, and the others never did. Good. King, keep us appraised of the scouting information. The rest of you, it's time to make a ruckus. We want the Telestines distracted so they aren't watching our ships come in. She hit a button and three separate systems came up. The first diversion. We have maintenance problems on these stations, necessitating food aid and some parts. She tapped at several dots. Stations tentatively aligned with the rebellion, but without any fleet resources aboard. These issues fall within the parameters of the technological easement, and with any luck, tell Robin we'll handle the food side of things. 
as much as she hated watching humanity bow and scrape for food aid. The fact was that they couldn't feed themselves. They needed the aid the Telestines gave them, and that was all on the discretion of what seemed to be the richest members of their society. Yet another reason for this rebellion. Who could say when that charitable streak would end? Till Robim had been sending aid to humanity out of his own coffers for decades. Surely he, she was fairly sure it was a he, would tire of it some day. Communications about these issues should obscure any signals coming from our ships, Walker continued. Please note that we are allowing these stations to handle all communications themselves, for the purposes of seeking UN aid to ensure technological easement. Her gaze swept around the table, meeting each pair of eyes. She did not have to remind them how important this was. If the UN found out about this mission, they were in for a world of trouble. The General Secretary would almost certainly do something, whether intentional or not, that would expose the scope of the operation. On that note, ma'am, we have arranged for Secretary Sokolov to be occupied with a great number of requests from the outermost stations, so that he doesn't get too suspicious about these. Larson looked up to meet her eyes and nodded. Thank you. Meanwhile, a diversion ship will send a transport for the parts they're requesting, which will break down near... She tapped the screen. This sensor. That will mobilize their fleet into the asteroid belt, won't it? Commander King frowned. They'll tell the Telestines they're doing the repairs themselves. The trick is, the sensor arrays become backup communications grids. If the ship signals for help, that hijacks the sensor's primary arrays. As long as our ship can keep it busy with transmissions about parts and repairs, we can get through the belt with minimal interference. Or so their source on Venus said. She wished she knew who that was. Whoever they were, they commanded a network larger than her own, and better connected. And if the cargo haulers knew who it was, they weren't saying. Right about now, however, Walker was willing to take any ally she could get. She stared down at the maps and tried to keep her expression blank. Ma'am? Commander King looked worried at her pause. At her side, Commander Delaney watched Walker, his eyes narrowing. Right. Walker turned back to the screens with cold determination. Now, the other diversions. I will free humanity from this hell if it's the last thing I do. Don't fail me, Pike. Chapter 5 Venus, 49 kilometers above surface Tong Estate, New Zurich Sir, what is it? Nian Tong kept his gaze fixed on the blaze of sunlight outside his office windows. He had stationed his personal chambers at the top of the floating estate, so that he would always be surrounded by a view of towering golden clouds. The estates on Venus were prized for precisely this view and his was one of the finest. That he did not like the view was another matter entirely. For him, it was a reminder. He turned his head at last as the footsteps approached. A detachment of the exile fleet has broken out of orbit around a Jupiter. Paris, his aide, placed a document reader on the desk behind him. Yes, I know. The admiral informed me. Neon sank his chin onto one hand. His focus was split now, between the view before him, a lightning storm brewing in the clouds to the east, and the constant scroll of information on the screens to his left. Information was his lifeblood. It was the only thing that mattered. Bullets could be dodged, money could be lost, power could be bought. But information? Nothing mattered more. Anything else of interest? Some are concerned about her choice regarding a mission specialist? The aide considered. And the Valiant is their escort ship. Internal reports suggest that it's damaged. Yes, she's asked us to see to its repairs if it survives this mission. His voice was neutral. He was not pleased by the Admiral's request, but he could hardly fault her for asking for his help, or for using a weakened ship for this mission. The odds that any of them would make it out of this gambit alive were slim. Then again, he could have predicted her actions when he told the Rebellion about the dawning. He had judged it worth the risk. He wondered if the rest of the fleet knew the dangers, and decided they likely did not. Laura Walker was not someone to risk a mission with too many facts, or too many people knowing said facts. 
He had never met the woman, of course, but it had not been too difficult to learn about her. Tell me about this mission specialist, William Pike, Paris said promptly. He clasped his hands behind his back, reciting information without looking directly at Neon. Approximately thirty-five years old, but his birth date is unknown. Native of Earth. Neon's eyes went up. There were humans still living on Earth, a great many of them, in fact, but the bulk of them were in chain gangs, used for whatever purpose the Telestines deemed most expedient. Official human settlement was banned under the terms of the treaty that had been so carefully written and imposed upon the human race. A farcical invitation for the Telestines to settle Earth, acknowledging their technological superiority and thanking them for the great kindness of not wiping out the species. Some humans still remained, of course, in defiance of the treaty. They were hunted like animals. His eyes flickered. Was there a recent escape I was not informed of? He was given passage off Earth twenty-four years ago. His family was feeding information to the rebellion. They were found, and the colony was destroyed. Out of loyalty, the rebellion saved as many from the camp as possible. Neon said nothing. His eyes were narrowed. This man, William Pike, knew Earth then. No wonder the Admiral had been so assured that she had a good mission specialist, and— Ah, of course. He's not part of the rebellion himself, is he? No, Paris hesitated. He was a childhood friend of the Admiral's, from Johnson Station at Ganymede. His current political views are unknown. Had been unknown, Neon smiled grimly. However careful he might have been in the past, William Pike was part of the rebellion now. Learn what you can about him and find me a way to get in contact with him on the surface, outside the Admiral's channels. Of course, sir. Paris did not protest. He never protested when Neon gave him impossible orders. Will there be anything else? Tell me if any of the rest of the fleet starts moving. Otherwise, no, you may go. Sir. Paris bowed and withdrew, bare feet padding on the marble floors. If one looked only at him, in his sleeveless vest and loose pants, long black hair drawn back in an austere braid. One might think this a tableau from Earth itself, and not in a floating estate in the caustic atmosphere of another planet. From the marble columns to the hanging plants, it was an image Neon did his best to cultivate in every room but this one. The view here was too obvious for such a deception to be successful. He swung his chair around and gave the screens his full attention. A few he moved to one side so that he could still catch a glimpse of the stock market feeds and the meager packets of information he was able to extract from the Telestine communications systems. The remaining screens arranged themselves into a map. He could see the advance scouts of the Exile fleet forging through the sensors placed within the asteroid belt. The Telestines, justifiably mistrustful of humanity in spite of its surrender, liked to keep tabs on the passage of ships toward Earth. Those sensors were the epitome of high tech. Small, easily overlooked, with self-destruct capabilities if anyone tried to take them apart. They were still, however, prone to debris collisions, and thus the catapult had made a surprising return to the human military arsenal. The Admiral's ships had been careful not to take out too many sensors in any one area. They charted a careful path, indirectly through the asteroid belt. From the number of fighters accompanying the mission, it was almost certain that Admiral Walker knew some of the defenses that lay between her fleet and its home planet. She did not know all of them, however, and it had not been in Neon's interest to tell her. To do so would be to betray how much he knew, his capabilities, and his limits. He had spent the past few years very carefully building a tiny arsenal of copycat satellites, working his way insidiously into the Telestine communication systems. He could quite easily access the peripheral systems, but it was Earth's defense he needed to crack. For that, he needed the fleet. Neon was not foolish enough to show his own hand just yet. Rebels with guns making a terrible commotion on the surface of the planet and stealing all of the Telestine's attention would make the perfect diversion. And. If he played his cards right, 
he would have access to a man not as loyal to the rebellion as to the idea of Earth. Someone like that could be the most useful tool of all. Admiral Walker had no idea what she had just handed him. Chapter 6 Jupiter Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point Command Center, New Beginning Station Admiral Walker watched the view screen with bated breath. It was finally time. The entire command center fell quiet as they watched the ships come out of deceleration burn at precisely 0800 ship time. The Valiant began its slow turn broadside to the bright blue planet below. Walker had only been there once before. But like that time, she now marveled at how the atmosphere seemed to glow like blue fire compared to the sterile vacuums of the snowball moons of Jupiter. At least it felt like she was there. In reality, she was watching from the relative safety of New Beginning Station at Jupiter. Thank God they'd stolen faster than light com tech from the Telestines, or this would never have been possible. On the view screen, it looked like the whole ship reverberated as the fighter bay doors slid open. She was, charitably speaking, an ugly ship, a refitted algae tanker that still smelled to high heaven in the fighter bays. She didn't need to be aerodynamic, and so she wasn't. Her hull was streaked and scratched, and her crew called her, however affectionately, the Troll. She had it where it counted, though. The old skim tubes for the algae harvest now provided the lateral thrust to spin the ship, and the seven tanks held forty-nine fighters, more than any other carrier the Exile fleet commanded. Delaney sometimes spoke of old aircraft carriers on Earth the size of small space stations and also of the starships humanity had one day hoped to send into space, floating cities with gardens and schools, made not just to support the basic rudiments of life, but to allow humanity to flourish. Walker paid more attention to those stories than she let on. Fighter Bay is reporting open. Lieutenant Commander Scott Larson kept his eyes fixed on the text readout. Thank you. Walker rested her palms lightly on the desk. Fighters beginning launch, Larson reported. Walker kept her eyes fixed on the screen. The planet curved gracefully beneath the Valiant, deceptively peaceful. She gave a quick look, counting the soldiers watching here. King, Delaney, and Larson. Captains Norange Lee and Kim. Her navigator, Ensign Harris. Men and women from all walks. Larson had been a friend of Walker's younger brother, one of the many children who played tag and retake Earth in the zero-G center of Johnson Station. Sarah Harris had been raised in the relative luxury of the Mars settlement, and Ed Norringe, people whispered, was the heir to an estate on Venus. Walker believed it. He rarely spoke up, and when others mentioned the squalid conditions on the stations, he furrowed his brow and tightened his lips, as if he felt guilty. On screen, the fighters began to emerge from the Valiant, taking up their formation in a three-dimensional wedge, pointed at the planet's surface. Nestled among them was Pike's ship, a heavier fighter with a capsule strapped to the bottom. Pike would have a rough, unguided landing, but they'd learned through trial and error that the Telestines didn't bother to shoot down objects in freefall. The Telestine sensors looked for the byproducts of propulsion, and accordingly, the Rebellion had designed its ships to tumble like asteroids, drift inert and plummet into gravity wells. The species they were up against had been in space since before the birth of Christ. Humanity scavenged the scraps of their technology, some given, some stolen. Every part of this plan had been tailored to fit their enemies' weaknesses. Like their ships, human technology was crude and limited, scarcely advanced beyond NASA's heyday in the last century. Hopefully it was good enough. They'd soon find out. No engagement yet from defensive satellites. I suppose that's good, right? Larson's gaze went to the readout, as if checking whether this could possibly be correct. Walker paused. No detection? No scrutiny at all? No Telestine engagement? She zoomed in on the wedge of the fighters and peered at a serial number. Fighter 18, give me its video feed. Yes, Mum. The officers all turned their heads to watch as one of the side screens came alive with the video feed. It was a grainy fisheye view. Earth appeared as a glowing arc at the bottom of the feed, and two other ships hovered just in sight out the windows. 
Walker's eyes picked out the somewhat larger shape of the ship carrying Pike's capsule. She folded her arms over her chest and tried not to tap her fingers. A flare of activity on the screen drew everyone's attention. Defensive systems engaging? Larson swallowed. He looked up at Walker, his gaze like steel. She nodded. There was nothing to do now but begin. Retreat was not an option. Formation spreading? Larson's voice almost trembled now. Bunching towards the sites of engagement. They're uh, doing well, Delaney said gruffly, stroking the white stubble on his chin. He sounded impressed. His eyes met Walker's and he gave a nod. They had created this formation together and tested the fighter pilots on it. When she worried and wished they had the old military manuals from Earth, he reminded her that they would have been no use. Three-dimensional warfare was new to humanity. Space is not the sea. And, in any case, as always there was no use in wishing for what they could not have. The Telestines had carefully destroyed the entire human military knowledge base, along with the militaries themselves. The records of bases and ships, all lost. Weapons, missiles, strategies, tactics, all gone. All they had left were traces of memory in those who had escaped the culling. That and instinct. And as a million years of survival had proved, humans had excellent instincts. Dive! She gave the order firmly, with confidence. Afterwards, her lips shaped silent words as she recited the Lord's Prayer. She kept her faith hidden. The cross below her uniform, the icons in the drawer of her locker, and she always prayed in silence. God can hear you anywhere, Laura, Grandmother's voice whispered. Her fingers clenched against the desk. A flicker caught her eyes. Air-to-air -air mass drivers detected, one ship down. The room went still. Walker swallowed and then the video feed pitched sharply to the left. On the screen, the wedge lengthened and began to tip. The rear guard fanned out and arced away in their own wedge formations. Blips of light flared and disappeared. Second ship down, two. No, three more. Larson did not seem to be able to avoid giving an account, even though they could all see it. Defensive systems engaging ahead of the scout group. A flare of light showed in the video feed and the ship swerved sideways. At the edges of the feed, Walker could see the other ships bunch and exchange places. Four minutes and nine seconds in, she tracked the progress of the lead group with her eyes. They were close to the stratosphere now. Close, very close. She looked between the feed and the screen. Dots were beginning to freeze in place as the ships that were supposed to monitor one another were blown out of the sky. A massive flare of light to starboard and the whole screen flickered. What the hell was that? The words came out before she could stop them. She looked over at Larson, who was staring, frozen at the video screen. Scott! What was that? Two detachments down, Mum. She didn't understand him. Two ships? Fourteen ships. What? What hit them? The satellites had defensive arrays, but nothing to take out fourteen ships in perfect unison. I don't know. Larson's eyes moved to the screen. They're forming up. The wedge tightened and lengthened yet again. Walker zoomed in, fingers moving unconsciously. The fighters had formed a cone around the dropship, and they were putting on speed. They arrowed desperately down toward the surface in a swift glow of compressed orange atmosphere. Two minutes and forty-eight seconds. The ship at the fore burst apart in a cloud of debris, and the formation spread to avoid the fallout before joining up again. The view of Pike's ship dropped away as their feed ship took the lead position. Walker's hand was over her mouth. It was her own voice she heard in her head now, two weeks back her own speech to the very pilots she was now watching die horrific deaths. The dawning gives us a fighting chance. If we want humanity to survive, the dropship must get to the surface and steal that tech. They had believed her, those pilots. They had hurled themselves into the defensive arrays. They had watched their fellow pilots blown to pieces. And now they were fanning out around the dropship for what cover they could find. She had ordered missions before that claimed lives. Lone scouts had died on the asteroids and moons that housed Telestine weaponry. Soldiers had gone and never returned. It was part of the cost. She had always known that. It was a different thing to see it, to watch them stare death in the face and continue on, regardless. Her fingers were white where she clutched the desk. 
Two more red blips disappeared, and then three more. Even Larson wasn't counting any longer. She could see Earth in the view screen. The rocky mountains rose like a spine from the flat plain as the ships hurtled down. The ground was rushing up. Drop ship, he trailed off. Hit. Drop ship has been hit. Her body jerked reflexively at the sound of his words. Larson's shoulders slumped with relief. Capsule intact and falling in the planned trajectory. She swallowed hard. The video screen wheeled as the remaining ships in the formation arced back up toward the distant bulk of the Valiant. A single dot showed the capsule falling. Falling. And Walker had time to wonder what Pike must have thought as he watched the debris streak past him and the capsule jolt loose from the ship. Did he know the dropship had been destroyed? The ships were accelerating as fast as their engines could go. She saw the Valiant began to move to intercept them. Valiant's accelerating to match fighter speed, Delaney murmured. The carrier was growing closer in the view screen. All but one fighter bay was closed, a grim acknowledgement of the loss. The remaining ships were still putting on speed as they left Earth's gravity well behind them. One more dot blinked out of existence, and the gaping maw of the fighter bay grew to enclose the whole of the screen. The video bounced as the ship hit the deck and slid, two more ships coming in behind, and the doors began to come down. Message from the captain of the Valiant, ma'am. Mission successful. Capsule intact on impact. Walker let out her breath, slowly. And a Valiant. Heading for the nearest dark space in the Telestine sensor array before resetting their course for Venus. And confirmation from Pike. Waiting on that, ma'am. Larson's fingers were tapping at the feeds. It seemed like an eternity before he nodded. Yes, ma'am. He's alive and on the surface. We did it. Delaney nodded at her. Walker said nothing. Relief made her weak at the knees. And yet, this was only the beginning. And if Pike failed, they did not have the resources to try such a thing again. Chapter 7 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent The capsule came loose from the drop ship with a terrifying sideways jolt and Pike felt the tiny sphere blow sideways into the sky. It was thrown against the web of restraints with bruising force. He hated this. He hadn't thought about it much on the two-week journey aboard the Valiant, and then they'd brought him out to see the capsule, and he'd had a moment of pure horror. It was tiny. It was unguided, and in the horror of the battle, watching the debris of the escort fighters streak past the tiny window as the drop ship wove through the air, he'd learned just how much he hated having no control at all over his fate. He hated the thought of falling without guidance, trusting that the parachute and webbing would cushion him against impact, and that the Telestines wouldn't bother to shoot him out of the sky. He hated watching the Valiant recede in his viewscreen. And then he was cut loose with a jerk, and something that felt very much like a blast. The capsule went into a tumble so quick that even the stabilizing gyroscopes on the webbing failed turning him over and over in a slow arc. The window spun around him in a blur, first showing the spine of the leading edge of the Rockies, rushing up far too quickly for comfort, then showing the receding chaos of the battle. The fighters were protecting his fall. He met out one quick silver dart of a ship, and then the vision was gone, and the next time his eyes tracked the sky, he could see nothing at all. The viewport swung into view of the ground again, and he realized that he had never expected to fear this return. The briefings had all started with, once you're on the surface. On the surface, and not a bloody smear, presumably. If he lived through this, he promised himself desperately. He was going to be a changed man. He would... Impact knocked the wind out of him before he could think of something to promise God. The webbing stretched down to allow him to slam against the floor of the capsule and started to fling him back up, and his body mercifully decided to lose consciousness before he could find out if he was going to hit the roof, too. He came to, still hooked in. Everything ached. There was the taste of blood in his mouth and a low droning in his ears. He clicked his teeth three times over the tiny pad at the back of his mouth to trigger the signal back to the Valiant. Was the ship still alive? The droning was getting louder. Droning? Oh my God, the droning! It had been twenty-four years, but there was no mistaking that sound. Telestine engines. 
He thrashed, looking around himself. He had to get out. But when he thought about releasing the webbing and painfully dropping onto the floor of the capsule, he flinched. Okay, don't think about it. There was hardly time in any case. He rocked himself forward in the webbing and stretched his feet to hit the bar at the back of the swing. They had wanted to give him something he couldn't press by accident on the way down, but he was fairly sure no one had thought about how painful swinging in the webbing would be after impact. It worked, though. There was a mechanical hiss, and the webbing dropped him onto the ground. Panic kept him moving as he peered out the least obstructed viewport of the three hatches. He cursed softly. If only he could see out, to know if they had a clear shot, see how close they were. He knew they had the weaponry to vaporize the capsule where it sat, and that they very well might. Running was still his best bet. He punched the button for the hatch and hauled himself out. The ships were behind him, still just specks in his view. There were two of them. Could they see him? Just pick the best choice and run with it, Walker's voice in his head. Just keep picking the best choice. That's all you can do. The best choice. And in this case, the only thing that qualified his choice as best was that it was the least bad. He took a breath of unfiltered air for the first time in two and a half decades, and then he took off. Pebbles slid under his boots. The wind added a strange sense of vertigo, and he forced himself not to look at the sky or the greenery as he ran, not to mark the shape of the peaks to his right. There was no time for homecoming now. There was only the chase. Did his sister, Christina, have time to run all those years ago? Did she lie in the burning forest, still alive after the first bombs, suffering in dread fear? If only he'd just started running when he first saw the ship all those years ago. To warn her, to save her. He'd long since buried those questions. He fixed his eyes on a shadow ahead, an outcropping of rock flanked by brambles, and prayed he could run faster, harder. He dove and rolled. His body slammed against the back of the makeshift cave, and pain burst across the bruises that were already there. A deafening, droning sound was blotting out everything else now. Pike curled his head down and forced himself to stillness. If they weren't shooting yet. The air was screaming, and he felt the hiss of gravel and dust across his skin. They were setting down nearby. Moving as slowly as he could, Pike uncurled himself and peered out from under the rock. The ships hovered over the ground. The Telestine anti-grav tech was a closely guarded secret. They were sleek, silver wedges, metal, layered to look almost like feathers. Everything the Telestines did had that sort of beauty. And there, getting out of the ships. Pike's jaw clenched. He'd never seen a Telestine up close before, but the figures emerging from the ships were clearly not human. They were close, though. And that was the most horrific thing. They walked with an eerily smooth gait. Their skin was so pale that it was a wonder they weren't burned in seconds by the strong morning sun. Slits lay along their necks, it looked almost raw, and they had no noses to speak of. Where hair should be, the skin over their skull rippled. It was like a child's drawing, utterly grotesque, and yet, at the same time, vaguely graceful and beautiful. And deadly, utterly, chillingly deadly. What had he expected? They took Earth, didn't they? With hardly a fight, he should have expected them to look something like the animals here. Maybe under those suits they had feathers like their ships. The two of them fanned out. They couldn't seem to see his footprints, but they were swinging their heads, unmistakably intelligent. They had broken up the area around the ships into two halves, and they were both circling. It wouldn't be too long before the nearest one reached the outcropping. And then... Pike went still. From the way their heads bulged in the back, it seemed certain that their brains were in their heads. They might not be human but severing the connection between brain and body seemed like a good bet for killing them. He'd have to move quickly, do his utmost to kill the one before the other heard. His fingers flexed and then clenched into fists. Quiet. He had to be quiet. Who knew what they could hear? And would he be able to overpower even one of them? By all accounts, they were at least twice as strong as the average human. But he was more than twice as angry as the average human. The roar of a gunshot startled him but he didn't care who was shooting, he was just glad someone was. He saw the nearest Telestine jerk around, searching for the source of the sound. He didn't have to be Telestine to see the look of surprise, or shocked betrayal. 
Rage filled him. How dare they look surprised? How dare this alien look around as if it hadn't been expecting someone to take a shot, when it wasn't even their planet to start with? How dare there be even the start of anger on the alien's face? They had killed, and killed, and killed, and then they had the gall to look surprised that someone was taking revenge on them for all the killing. He had to focus. He was never going to get a better shot than this. Pike launched himself through the brambles and into the alien's body with a primal yell. His fist shot out and connected, and there was the satisfying crunch of cartilage and bone under his knuckles. The telestine went down, and he was on top of it a second later, chest heaving as his fist slammed down over and over again. He didn't stop, until the grotesque face stopped wincing. Just a bloody pulp beneath him. He panted, and slowly stood up. The body lay still. Chapter 8 Earth. Mountains near Denver, North American continent. Hey, the voice was light, jolting Pike out of his reverie. He'd been looking down at his blood-covered hands. He didn't know what color he'd expected Telestine blood to be. Certainly not red. Red blood? That was a human color. It seemed profane that the alien bled the same as his mother and Christina. He looked up. The man picking his way down out of the spires of rock nearby was probably only a little older than Pike himself. Brown hair, with the first few streaks of gray, fell long over the forehead, and the man's work-withered fingers held the shotgun easily. Confidently. After the endemic ill health of the space stations, this man looked all at once weathered and hearty, skin with the pink no Martian, or even Venetian could match. Thin yet muscular, not like the billion or so Jovian humans clinging to life out on Jupiter's snowballs, living on carefully formulated protein supplements and minuscule gravity, and yet he moved with an easy grace that only an Earther could truly have in a gravity well, and only natives at that, not drones, not the Telestine's slaves. He didn't seem at all winded despite the altitude. He stuck out one hand with a ready grin. Charlie Boyd! Are you Bill Pike? I... Uh, yes. Pike looked around himself at the bleeding Telestine bodies and the scrub brush bending delicately in the wind and wiped his hand off before reaching out. And then he saw the mountains and the breath left him entirely. There was no sight like this in the solar system. No hologram that made it real. Even Olympus Mons on Mars, though far taller, was a pale shadow to these. The peaks were impossibly sharp against the sky. He tried to orient himself, remember east and west. It was morning. The sun was still rising. A hawk soared high above as it hunted for breakfast. And the air. The air was fresh, alive. Pike felt something in him, a knot. He wanted to cry. He clenched his fingers and turned slowly. Plains, sky, mountains. There were animals moving below them. Not stock animals, not animals in carefully constructed cages going nowhere while their feet plodded on little treadmills. These animals just... were. There was grass. A dozen kinds of grass and different shades of rock, and even the browns and faded greens of the high desert seemed like an assault on the eyes after so many years on ships and stations, breathing sterile, recycled air. You were born here, Charlie came to stand beside him. He shrugged at Pike's questioning look. The briefing said as much. When did you leave? When I was eleven. That wouldn't mean much to him, but it didn't have to. The Telestines found us. The rebellion got us out, took us to Johnson Station. Ganymede, he clarified when Charlie frowned. It's a moon of Jupiter. Is that one out or in? Charlie frowned. Pike felt a stab of annoyance quickly tamped down. Out, he said curtly, assuming he meant outside the asteroid belt. It was his mother's annoyance. His mother, who had not wanted her children to grow up ignorant, who said they had to know everything children were taught before so they could pick up where humanity left off when the Telestines were gone. His mother was dead, and those who hadn't cared as much as her were still here. Whatever Charlie saw in his eyes, he didn't press the issue. We should go, 
They'll be sending more ships soon. Should we destroy these? No point. We used to try, but they have locators of some sort. The next ships always come right to where the last two were. We've got about half an hour, probably, to get back to camp. Pike looked around himself. He couldn't see anything habitable nearby. It's there. Charlie looked satisfied. But they can't see it either. That, at least, he could approve of. Pike smiled and let the man lead him down the slope. Do you go by William or Bill? Charlie called over his shoulder. Pike, actually. His father had called him William, and his mother had called him Bill. And after the escape, he hadn't wanted to be either. While his father died a slow death from grief, alone in their apartments on Johnson Station, Pike had worked to forget everything about Earth, about Christina and his mother, about the rebellion. He was Pike, he told his father, not William. And he let his lip curl in contempt when his father asked if he'd be joining the rebellion. He didn't have to say anything to remind his father what the rebellion had cost them. He hadn't been on Johnson Station when his father finally died, and wondered sometimes if the man had thought of Christina and their mother at the end. The guilt was familiar, but not so easy to dispel as usual. Maybe it was the mountains. Maybe it was the shotgun in Charlie's hand. Or maybe it was the thought Pike hadn't been able to banish in two weeks, wondering if his father would be proud to see him now. He'd come here to Earth again, he told himself. Not for the rebellion. Maybe they'd save humanity, maybe not. He hadn't believed that was possible in years. Too many people. Too much despair. Too many odds stacked against them. He was just here to see home again. To see mountains. To breathe air. To feel sun. He wondered if Walker knew that, and felt a fresher guilt. Walker believed. He didn't want to hurt her, he told himself. He just had a clearer idea of the odds. He realized Charlie had been speaking. Mm hmm I said it'll take a few days to get to the lab. Charlie used the gun to point north along the range. You can't see it from here, but last we knew it was moving away, up toward Laramie. One of their labs? Pike raised his eyebrows. Well, sure. Charlie looked bemused. He gestured to the grimy clothes and the old-style shotgun. Did you think we made the dawning? What is the dawning? No idea the man said cheerfully. That's your call to figure out, and frankly, none of my business, he sobered. The rest of us, we're going for something else. For the first time, Pike felt a flicker of unease. What are you going for? Rescue mission? We think there are people in the lab, too. Pike stopped. We gotta keep moving. Charlie didn't turn to look. What do you mean there are people up there? I mean, there are people up there, in the labs. Why? The man tensed. Nobody knows. But if you ask me, experiments. Did Walker know about that? If she did, why hadn't she said so? He heard her voice as clearly as if she'd been next to him, almost amused. What would it change, Pike? Maybe he didn't have a clearer idea of the odds, he thought. Maybe she just had hope. Maybe this was what his father had always called inexplicably a Hail Mary pass. That was something to think over later. Pike looked to where Charlie was picking his way down the mountain. The tension in his shoulders hadn't eased, and his face was tight with anger. When he caught Pike looking, the man's face twisted. Just ask. I know you want to. He hadn't asked because it didn't matter, and because he didn't want to know. Pike looked down at the ground, passing under his feet. Who? Who? Who's up there that's yours? He asked quietly. My wife? Our daughter? Charlie looked north, and his eyes were distant. Three years ago. Pike let his breath out slowly. He didn't want to offer false promises, but he knew that was what he was supposed to do. We'll avenge them, he promised. Charlie flinched, then defiantly. I'm going to find them. You're... Pike broke off. They're dead, he wanted to say. Even if they weren't killed when they were taken, they're dead now. No one lasts three years in a Telestine lab. From the bitter smile on his lips, Charlie knew just what Pike was thinking. He didn't bother to argue. He just gave a shrug, artfully careless. Who cares what you think? His eyes asked. They walked on in silence. 
Chapter 9 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent Where are we going? You'll want to see this. Eva, a blonde woman who looked altogether too small for the impressive array of weaponry she was carrying, led the way up the path as Pike struggled to keep up. Behind him, the other leaders of the rebellion cell talked amongst themselves in low voices. Their camp was only rebellion members, no children. Some of the members appeared to be spouses, but there were few of those. At some point during the past twenty-four years, the rebellion had learned the awful cost of its operations. Pike tried not to feel bitter about that. Here we are. Eva held out a hand to pull him up onto an outcropping. You're not afraid of heights, are you? No. But the dizzying view was more seductive than he remembered. Sunlight dappled on the rough forest at the base of the foothill below, and he could just see himself spreading his arms and leaping. He swallowed. Eva wasn't paying attention, though. Her arms were crossed, and she was staring out at the Telestine city far in the distance, that hovered over old Denver. Her blue eyes looked furious. Pike remembered that look too well from his father. He had always dreaded coming up into the mountains due to the inevitable angry lectures about the Telestines taking the planet. Then Pike hadn't cared much. The occupation was all he'd ever known, and as a child, it had been hard to mourn a city he'd never seen. He looked at their rough camp of forty and wondered how millions of people had ever lived all together, jumbled up in tall buildings. Now Pike, a product of humanity's exodus despite his native origins, forced himself to look at the ruins of the city and the Telestine station that hovered above it. It was sleek, with shining metal curved all along the bottom. Sunlight gleamed, and the metal gracefully arced up into spikes. Along the top were their buildings. Skyscrapers, he recalled wryly. The Telestine buildings fit the description better than any human buildings ever had. Look, Eva handed him a pair of binoculars. Under the... under their city. He set the binoculars to his eyes and adjusted the view cautiously. It had been a long time since he'd been somewhere he could use binoculars. Nothing on a ship was far away enough, and nothing in space was close enough. For a while, he wasn't sure what he was looking for. He scanned past ruined structures, struts of metal and shattered glass that he could still only partially pick out. It was a tangle of green in the middle of the city something that reminded him of the hydroponic air refreshers on the stations, but massive. And then he saw it. Movement. He squinted. It looked like one of the long repair bots stretching up to the tops of one of the buildings. What is that? He tried to dial in, but could not sharpen the view. He looked over at Eva. Are they trying to repair the city? She laughed at that. Actually laughed. The sound was harsh. No! They're tearing it down! If we could just set that bot on top of their cities, we'd be good to go. He couldn't keep from smiling. It's not a bot. She didn't smile back. It's a chain gang. He frowned, shook his head. The term made no sense to him. Humans. Well, drones, chained together. She jerked her head at the city. There are platforms all the way up that building. And every day the humans walk up and demolish a little bit more of it. Drones. Human, but not quite, it seemed. He'd only ever met one, and he was strangely passive. His personality a void. Rumor had it that the Telestines bred them. Docile, meek, unquestioning. Intelligent, but empty. Perfect slave. Pike held the binoculars back up to his face. He scanned across the city. Now that he knew what he was looking for, he caught the flickers of movement on a few of the structures. There would be more of them that he could see. Why not just blow it up? They have nukes, don't they? He knew that all too well. They're sensitive to radiation, too, or so we think. Plus, they're taking the materials, melting them down. We think they're salvaging the city. Probably to build more of their own. Easier than mining and smelting the raw ore. That can't be worth it. They had the technology to extract minerals more efficiently than humans ever had, surely. Of course it can, when you don't have to care about the labor. Her eyes were fixed on the city, and though she could see nothing from this distance, he knew she was seeing the gangs in her mind's eye. 
And they wouldn't want to ruin the view by tearing the ground open, now would they? He had no answer for that. There was no answer for that. Could a Telestine appreciate a view? For a free human, it was unknowable. What are they building? Their own city, we think. For the first time, she sounded doubtful. To be honest, we aren't sure. Sometimes it almost seems like we see military activity, but they don't have anyone to fight that we know of. She shrugged. Serve them right if someone else came to take Earth from them, I guess. But then we'd be even worse off, wouldn't we? Better the enemy you know? I never know what to hope for. She cleared her throat. Anyway, that's what's happening here. Just so you know. Where are they getting the people? She just shook her head. Seriously, are they getting pulled off stations? She gave a bark of laughter. No, don't. Just don't. She swallowed and pointed north. It's clear enough today you might be able to see the lab. He hesitated, but it was clear she wasn't going to explain anymore. He raised the binoculars and adjusted them. The mountain peaks swung by in dizzying clarity, and then the tiny shape of an airship. They would be going on foot up into the mountains, he realized. They would watch the airship grow in their view until they were dwarfed beneath it. It would hang, heavy over the mountains, the way the military ship had hung over the camp so long ago. He swallowed hard. How are we getting in there? Are we going in some of their ships? We can't work their ships. Her regret told him that they had tried it. Best we can tell, they interface telepathically or something. Maybe it's a security system that only recognizes Telestine physiology? You get into the cockpit and it's all smooth. There's something that looks like a control panel but nothing on it. And we've never seen them use one. We studied their bodies, but we can't tell much from that either. So how are we getting up there? We have some hovercraft. The Rebellion sent us two. Your dropship was supposed to be a third, but after it got blown up... She shrugged. What? The ship carrying your capsule. They designed it for impact. It was going to free fall after you. But Charlie told us how it got blown up. He remembered the jagged strut protruding from one of the sides of the capsule and felt a chill. He thought the holds just came off when the capsule released. Now the sideways jolt made more sense. He couldn't think about it or he'd be sick. So, uh, what's the plan? We stash the ship north a ways. We'll go on foot, rendezvous there, and take the ships up. You look for the dawning chip thingy, and we'll run rescue missions back to the ground with one of the two ships. That way you can still get off the lab as soon as you find the dawning. You say chip. You don't have any idea what I'm looking for, do you? She gave a helpless shrug. I mean, I know it's a computer of some sort. But all of their computers we've seen are white cubes or smaller chips. And there's got to be more than one in the lab, right? The information came from the Rebellion. We figured you'd know. We don't even know how you found out about it. The labs don't emit any signals that we can tell. Someone would have to be in their communication system. He sighed and rubbed at his eyes, handed the binoculars back to her. Well, we'll have a couple of weeks to think about it. He gave one look back at the city then turned and pushed his way past the other members to start back down the path. A losing, suicidal plan. Why the hell had he agreed to come back? That's right. Mountains. Air. Sun. Walker. Dawning. It sure as hell better be worth it. Chapter 10 Jupiter. Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point. Fighter Crew Locker Room. EFS Intrepid. A whole squadron. Dave Hernandez, or Fisheye to his fellow pilots, snapped his fingers and leaned forward to whisper meaningfully. Just gone. Toast. Jodido. Damn it, Fish. Theo McAllister gave the pilot an exasperated look and could only guess the vulgar translation of that last Spanish word. He'd given up on trying to keep rumors about the last mission from spreading, but he was in no mood to let things get out of hand. His promotion to CAG was recent, but anyone and everyone knew the value of morale. Morale Fisheye was currently destroying. They should know what we're up against, Jay, Fisheye protested. He saluted, though, and McAllister knew the pilot's protest wasn't sincere. He looked at the group and then back to McAllister. Jay Bururo. Why weren't we in the first group? Jay Buludo, 
McAllister had learned months ago that Fisheye calling him Swollen Balls was actually an endearment. What, you wanted to be? McAllister snapped his fingers, echoing Fisheye's earlier gesture. Jodido? Screwed? He gave a grin at the others when they laughed. I'm sure the bastards would oblige. He headed for his locker at the edge of the room. No, we're just... Fisheye clapped a couple of the other pilots on the shoulder and hurried after McAllister. He settled into a chair nearby. We're on a flagship, you know. Should have been us, Jay. Like they were gonna send the flagship in for an early battle, guns blazing? McAllister leaned in, keeping his voice low. You know they aren't planning anything until Mercury's ready. They must have found something big. But you know we're gonna get our shot. Not like the Admiral's own ship is gonna miss the show when we take Earth back, right? Fisheye snorted in agreement, unbelievably skinny, with a shock of blonde hair and the palest eyes McAllister had ever seen. The young man had found his way to the Rebellion from far-flung Pluto, and he'd never lost the look of some alien creature that had climbed out of the depths of the ocean, translucent and blinking. How he'd wound up looking like that, with a name like Hernandez and Argentine heritage to boot, McAllister had never figured out. Hell of a pilot, though, once you got used to having someone who looked like a ghost on your team. What's going on? Tox settled in behind them and leaned close. Telling secrets about me? McAllister reached out to clasp her hand, then bump it in greeting. Nodding as Princess, a rough-looking, stubbled man settled in beside her. The two were practically inseparable. They even looked like twins, even though they shared no family, and had grown up on different stations. Same thick brown hair, same black eyes, same olive skin. Originally, it had been Nick who had the nickname Tox, always following the plan rigidly, pointing to his watch and Rachel, who was princess. And then Fisheye had pointed out it would be funnier the other way around, and the names had stuck. Nick had taken it well, after an initial bout of sullen mumbling and profanities. Just about your curious affinity for a dude that looks like your brother. McAllister leaned in toward her, eyebrows waggling slightly. So? You into him? Me into you? Come on, we need a distraction. She smiled lopsidedly, flipped him off, and said nothing. Right. He grabbed another chair and sank into its sagging cushion. Okay, Earth, how much do you know? McAllister raised his eyebrows as he stared directly at the two newcomers. Nothing. Tox gave him a sweet smile. No one on your crew would gossip, LT. McAllister gave her a look. He'd been given strict instructions by the Admiral not to let his crew spread rumors about what had happened on Earth, but both of them had known even then that it was impossible to keep that sort of news from spreading. For a fighter crew, gossip about other crew's missions was like candy or crack. The door opened, and Admiral Walker walked in. Everyone went quiet and jumped up to their feet. Just do your best to look surprised. He threw the words back, pitched low, and snapped into a salute with the rest of them. Ice! The admiral laced her fingers behind her back, taking a moment to look them over. By now I'm guessing that all of you will know what occurred on Earth several hours ago. There was a shame-faced mutter of agreement, and McAllister relaxed. The admiral wasn't mad. That was good. She might be five foot nothing if she stood up very, very straight, but she could be more imposing than anyone he knew. She was an arresting figure, with eyes like fire and steel, even when calm. But now that he knew this wasn't going to be an angry meeting, McAllister couldn't keep his eyes on her any longer. Not with Commander King standing at her side. His eyes traced over King's small, straight nose, the heart-shaped face, black hair bound back in a braid and struggling to escape. She stared straight ahead, her at-attention pose perfect, but her cheeks took on a slight tinge of pink. She could feel him staring, clearly. Imperative that you follow the instructions of your CAG. The Admiral's voice drew McAllister back to reality, and he looked over just in time to meet her gaze and nod seriously. Fisheye elbowed him in the side, grinning. He caught McAllister staring. McAllister shook his head, glaring a reminder. Of the pilots in the room, McAllister was fairly sure that only Fisheye, Tox, and Princess knew about him and Commander King, and he wanted to keep it that way. For one thing, the Admiral wasn't one to tolerate this sort of thing. She'd have him shipped off to some other vessel in a second if she knew what was going on. 
Any words you'd like to say, Lieutenant? The Admiral was staring at him now, her face so bland that he wondered if she'd seen him staring too. Yes, thank you. He leaned forward so he could sweep his eyes around the room. He didn't dare look at King again. He knew his smile would give him away, if the discreet bulge in his pants hadn't already. Whatever he did, he absolutely could not, must not, think about how she felt. This morning, stifling her laughter against his shoulder in the showers, he cleared his throat. Oh, we've seen some of the tricks the bastards have up their sleeves now. He nodded at them and shot a glance at the admiral. Uh, sorry for my language, ma'am. Fuggers, not bastards. She only nodded, holding back a smile. There was one thing you could always count on with the admiral. She hated the Telestines more than any of them. Rat bastards will be fine, Lieutenant. He grinned. But this doesn't change anything, McAllister continued. He met the eyes of the others, holding each gaze until they nodded. Fisheye, Princess, Tox, the handful of other pilots. We didn't get into this because we thought we had better tech than them, right? There was a nervous laugh. We got into this because we know we're worth more than this. We know that if we train hard, if we go in there like I know we can, we're going to blast them out of the sky and we're going to take back Earth. A cheer from his pilots made him grin. So we go back out today and we train. McAllister jabbed his finger at them. He scanned the back row for more nods. We remember the ones who were lost. We honor their sacrifice and we get ready for the big one. You with me? The cheer came again. Pilots stamping their feet and McAllister nodded to the admiral. His smile faded slightly at the look on her face, but grew again as his gaze drifted past her to King. The woman was smiling, biting her lip as she clapped for his speech, and he knew she was thinking exactly what he was thinking. They'd talked about it, in whispers, in her quarters. No more stolen moments, no more ships or stations, no more frickin' protein rations that tasted like fishy cardboard. Some day, they'd build a real life together. On Earth. Thank you. The Admiral's voice cut over the cheering, and she waited for it to die down. As your CAG has told you, the next step for now is training. We're still reviewing the data from the last mission, and... She broke off as an officer slipped into the room and came to whisper in her ear. What? Her voice was low, but McAllister caught the sudden anger there. The officer looked as if he would rather be doing anything than delivering his message. He leaned even closer to speak the next few words. But that's... The Admiral bit off the words. She forced a smile for those assembled. If you'll excuse me, something has come up. As soon as the review is complete, we will begin training on new maneuvers based on our analysis from the last mission. McAllister, you have the floor. And she was gone, king at her heels, the door slamming behind them. Something was up, something big to make her leave like that. Chapter 11 Venus, 49 kilometers above surface. Tong Estate, New Zurich. Just tell me what I'm looking for. The Admiral's voice was halfway between ugly and desperate. Oh, for the love of... Look, we don't have the time to be checking every computer in the lab. The Telestines are going to mobilize as soon as the alarms trip. The team will be at the lab in three days, and they don't know what they're even looking for. I'm sitting on a message from the mission specialist right now, and they don't even have a guess. There was a pause, and Neon knew that she was staring at the message. He cast his eyes down at one of the screens. He knew the message she was looking at. He knew, in fact, every communication that had gone between the Rebellion outpost and the mission team. None of us know what we're looking for, the message read. Give me anything, any detail. The team is anxious, and half of them are planning to go off and look for kidnapped family members instead. I don't think I can stop them. His frustration was clear. Neon felt some sympathy for that, but while there was only one mission for William Pike, there were many for humanity. He wondered why they thought there were humans there at the research station, the target. He'd been toying with the idea of asking his Telestine contact if there truly was a human experimentation program. Tel Rabim was one of their greatest advocates within Telestine society. Surely he'd throw him a bone, some snippet of information on the subject. 
But if some of them had decided to use captive humans as lab rats, would they listen to a lone voice of dissent? Even one as powerful as Tel Rabim? Are you still there? Admiral Walker's voice was curt. The FTL packet transmitter caused a slight waver in her voice where there was none. She'd hate that. Now that he'd given them the tech to speak with him, stolen off a Telestine satellite that had, as his father would have said, fallen off the back of a truck, she treated him as if he were one of her soldiers. He did not bother to remind her that he was not. Their interests were aligned. But he was not a member of the Rebellion. He did not take commands from her. She could forget that at her peril. Yes, he kept his responses short. His voice should be distorted enough to be genderless, but the Admiral was getting closer every day to learning his identity. The less audio he gave her to work with, the better. I can only tell you what I know, and that is that the dawning is movable. It has been moved between laboratories before. So it isn't the laboratory itself. There was relief in her voice. I did check that. To the best of my knowledge, no. But all we can do is hope that it's small enough to get onto a shuttle. Yes. And if it's not... Neon settled back in his chair and fixed his eyes on the swirl of clouds outside the window. He waited until his anger dissipated before he spoke. If it is not, we will be in roughly the same situation as before. No, we will not. Her voice was flat. We will have lost forty-six fighters. Almost five percent of my pilots. We will have tipped our hand regarding the fact that we have a fleet at all, and we will have a smaller fleet to use next time for an attack. An attack they will be better prepared to repel. Admiral, with all due respect, our fleet was so outmatched that no marginal change in their present defensive structure will make the slightest bit of difference. The fact that those fighters succeeded at all is a miracle. A silent, simmering anger came down the line. Neon could work with silence. He pushed himself up to pace, hands clasped behind his back, eyes still fixated on the clouds. Did you think the Telestines were unaware of our activities? Did you think they had not noticed our rebellion? There was a silence. Yes, the Admiral admitted finally. I did. Neon raised his eyebrows. At least it wasn't bluster. He had grown used to face-saving lies in the earliest permutations of the rebellion, and it had been tiresome. General Esa had been the worst. At least Walker had a sense of pragmatism and dignity about her. They don't know where it is, Neon said. Or at least, I am fairly certain that they don't. I am not certain they can reliably tell the difference between military base activity and standard station activity. There was only silence. Admiral, so, you're telling me, she took a deep breath, that if they take revenge for our attack two weeks ago, it might be anywhere and on anyone? He paused to stare at the communications unit on the desk, a half-smile on his lips. Their relationship was one of deception, a tenuous alliance at best. Every once in a while, however, the Admiral surprised him. Now, panicked not that the Telestines might come for her, but that they might come for someone else. She surprised him a great deal. He tried to reassure her. For all we know, they may think that the attack two weeks ago was the entirety of our fleet. I think we can safely assume that if they truly believed any one of our settlements was a rebellion base, the settlement would have been gone long ago. You're sure, in so much as anyone can be sure of anything where the Telestines are concerned? He was giving away too much of his speech pattern. He paused to consider before he spoke again. She interrupted his train of thought. Our mission specialist mentioned potential military activity on Earth. Could that be leading up to an attack? To tell her, or not, Neon considered for a long moment. Yes. There may be a factional dispute going on within Telestine society. Really? She sounded as if the thought had never occurred to her before. It's hardly out of the question. Simpler words, simpler sentences. Earth is not their home. I don't know if they all agreed that settling here was wise. I'm given to understand there's a cult of some sort. More than one, perhaps. But it's difficult to know how similar they are in that respect. We see similar disputes among our people aboard the space stations and moons. Competing power structures, groups with diametrically opposed interests. 
The Telestines could be the same, which, if true, would be fortuitous. Competing interests can be exploited, after all. I hadn't thought of that. She paused, and he could see her staring into the middle distance. A still shot of her, a candid photo taken some eleven years back in the hallways of Ares Station at Mars, hovered on one of his own screens. He wondered what she looked like now. How do you know about the faction dispute? He hesitated. The truth was that he didn't know, not for a fact. It was only a suspicion, a shadow in the data he saw. Instinct. And how could he tell if his human instincts could be trusted to shed any light on Telestine society? I cannot share that at this time. We're on the same side, are we not? Her voice was tight. How little she knew. She, of all people, should have guessed. My sources remain my own. And the rebellion, of all people, should understand the need for secrecy. He took a seat once more. I am awaiting confirmation on several pieces of information. A factional war could be exploited. The words were a reminder and a test. Unlikely, at the moment. If we can't figure out what the factions are or how to interact with them, may I remind you that we have yet to find a way to interface reliably with their computer systems, however reliably they can interface with ours? What does that mean? She said. The question was sharp. It means that the Telestines are eminently capable of interacting with us when they so choose, and they may, indeed, have been doing so for quite some time. We see their communications. I don't mean the broadcasts. Every year or thereabouts, the Telestines liked to remind humanity of the treaty between them. There seemed to be increasing emphasis placed on the loyalty of the individual to the best interest of their species. That had been one of the first hints that all was not rosy in Telestine society. But that was not the matter at hand right now. Neon looked at the communications unit as he spoke. Haven't you wondered at some of the information coming from the rebellion cells on Earth? There was a very long pause. How do you mean? He bit back an instinctive oath. She knew. He knew that she was well aware of what he meant. No one in their right mind this high up in the rebellion would be unaware of the possibility he was implying. She just wanted him to say it outright. She wanted him to be the one suggesting it. He hated soldiers. If she wanted him to spell it out, she was going to have to work for it. I mean that many of your cells still refuse to be identified. They're able to conceal their location, and their information is unusually complete. I could be reporting from within the labs. It's what I would do if I were in their position. Was it? He wondered. If they're in the labs, they're working only with Telestine equipment. He was losing patience with this game. And that's impossible, as we well know. I think you understand the point I am making, Admiral. She ignored that. If they're surrounded by Telestine technology, they might have figured out how to use it. She retorted at once. That was an intriguing thought. In the meantime, he was not going to continue to let her dance around the issue. Do you not think it possible, Admiral Walker, that some of your sources are Telestine? No, she said flatly. Why? Are some of yours? Accusation was heavy in her voice. Traitor. He did not particularly care. A great many people might call him that before this was done. In the meantime, he would not let her take some imagined high road. Telestine sources could be useful. You were the one who suggested exploiting the brewing factional conflict. Not by working with any of them. Any benefit to them in the short run would surely be outweighed in the long run. Even so, her voice broke to no argument, none of them can be trusted. To them we are insects. Do you truly believe any of them would help us? Some of them do. There have always been factions of humans who advocated for other species. Why not Telestines advocating for us? Tell Robin, no, a flat denial. He took a deep breath. Admiral, are you quite sure that your principles aren't harming the rebellion? She cut the call at that, and Neon's eyebrows rose. Interesting, very interesting. He strolled to the window again to look out at the billowing orange Venetian clouds and asked himself the question he asked every time he spoke with her. The question the rest of the rebellion seemed not to think to ask. What was 
Admiral Laura Walker's endgame. It bothered him that in five years he still had not come up with an answer. Sir, Paris had appeared silently, as he always did. Yes, Neon did not look over. We're detecting Telestine fleet activity near Jupiter. Neon froze. Jupiter, how did they get there without us knowing? But it would have been easy. Far too easy. Who knew the limits of Telestine technology? They had given humanity the dregs and what they kept for themselves. Now he shook his head. Warn them. Warn Walker. And get me whatever feed you can on the Telestine communications. We'll help the rebellion however we're able to. Laura Walker's end game was no longer important. He might not trust her with a fleet, but humanity could not afford for it to be destroyed. Chapter 12 Jupiter Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point Command Center, New Beginning Station The room was silent. Everyone looked studiously away from Walker as she rested her fists on the desk. Her chest was heaving. Telestine sources? Did their source on Venus not understand what the Telestines had done to humanity? Did this person honestly believe that she would trust a Telestine with anything? Ma'am, it was Commander King, even if the Telestines are behind some of our intelligence, even if they're just trying to get us to take out their enemies in other factions, we'll take them down. You think it's good that we would fight for them in their faction wars? Her head swung, and she was pleased to see King flinch at the look on her face. Spend our own blood to bar them victory! She could barely get the words out. Show them our ships! Any ship we take down now is one less to take down in the final fight, Delaney offered. The final fight is supposed to happen with their defensive grid down. They aren't supposed to have fighters in the air at all! The room fell silent. Our sources are not... Telestine, Walker cradled her elbows in her hands as she forced the words out. I refuse to believe that. We would know. She swept her eyes over the room and the others nodded quickly. They knew better than to disagree right now. Every one of them met her eyes and she knew from the tightening of their lips that even if they did not believe her, they would not speak of the suggestion again. She could live with that. Her eyes fixed on Larson, whose gaze was firmly fixed on his screens. Larson. He looked up and seemed to see the tension in the room for the first time. He looked around himself and cleared his throat awkwardly. Oh, but it's just, I am getting the weirdest feedback coming in on our systems. It's like the outpost on Adrastia. It disappeared? It not quite disappeared. It, it's, it's like trying to look at something through steam, you know? Lots of static. Solar flare? Offered Captain Norange. Larson shook his head. Uh, Adrastia is the second closest moon to Jupiter, so it's tidally locked, and the sun is completely blocked out for the next hour. It couldn't be a flare. The rest of the officers looked at one another. When the line on the desk rang, everyone jumped. Walker reached out to open the call. Admiral Walker, the Telestine fleet has found you. The distorted voice was back, calm. They seem to have appeared near Adrastia and are sweeping the system. I don't know if they know where the fleet is, but they'll find you soon. Clear the station. Walker heard her own voice speaking. Delaney, King, with me to the Intrepid. You two, Larson and Aris. Norange, Lee and Kim to your ships. Everyone take your direct reports. Larson, sound the evacuation order. Everyone, move. What do we do when we're there? Ensign Harris had stood up, but she was frozen there. Evacuation first. Walker's voice was sharp. Get the station between us and the Telestines. Dump all the thrust you can to get around the side of the planet, and then cut your engines. If they were drifting, giving off no signals, there was a chance the Telestines wouldn't see them. Let's not be sitting ducks. Yes, ma'am. Larson punched a code into the computer, and the klaxons wailed to life. People should be leaving the shuttle base any moment now. It's a red alert. No one should be stopping for anything. At a timer. We can't afford to wait. Yes, ma'am. No one moved. No! She jerked her head at Delaney and King to follow her. Harris was already moving. New Beginning Station was far from full. Thankfully, King had suggested long ago that they should keep as many people on the ships as possible, even while docked at the station, and have the shuttles on constant alert and ready for the rest of them, in order to be able to leave at a moment's notice. Maybe the only ones who will die today will be the officers. 
she thought with black humor. Walker took the corridors toward the heart of the ship and the ladders that would lead them to the shuttle bay. The countdown was flashing there on the walls. Five minutes thirty-five, five thirty-four, five thirty-three, and Walker nodded in satisfaction to see the groups emerging at a jog from hallways nearby. No one was carrying anything, and no one was panicking. They drilled new rebellion soldiers obsessively on the layout of their ships, and the soldiers now made their way to their assigned shuttles without shoving or jostling, though a few called goodbyes to one another. What's going on? A new soldier paused in the doorway of Walker's shuttle. Walker pushed him inside without answering and pointed to one of the seats. She strapped herself in and watched as the other officers did the same. She caught Harris's eye as the door of the woman's shuttle closed, and they both gave nods. In a way, they had been waiting for this since day one. It was almost a relief that the Telestine attack had finally come. Or it would be if they didn't all die in the next few minutes. Mom, Delaney settled next to her. He pitched his voice low. Do you have a plan once we do get to the ships? Yes. And no one was going to like it. She shook her head at him. No details yet. Still working on the specifics. She didn't need him arguing with her while she thought. All shuttles loaded. Larson's voice sounded incongruously from the pilot's chair over the linked intercoms. Depressurizing shuttle bay. She heard the shuttle bay doors begin to open, and the shuttle rocked on its moorings as the air blasted out into space around them. Larson was taking this as quickly as he dared. Godspeed and good luck. Larson's voice was quieter now. Hope to see you all soon. The answers came back quietly. The pilots were very aware that they might be emerging from the station into a war zone. Given what they knew of Telestine weaponry, the station was no safer, but the illusion was there. Space never felt quite as big as when you were in a shuttle. No activity showing in the immediate area. Larson's voice was a bit too relieved for Walker's comfort. She didn't want him spooking the rest. Engines are spun up. Maneuvers will begin as soon as shuttles are aboard. Thank God they had drilled for this. Walker clutched her fingers around the harness and stared straight ahead as the shuttles split off for the ships. The Intrepid loomed through the windshield of the shuttle. Her eyes traced over the lettering as she gave a silent prayer. Did the Telestines understand the way humans named ships? Did they realize that this was an expression of hope, of defiance? It seemed like an eternity before the shuttle thudded down in the bay, and Walker's eyes snapped open. She must have closed them to keep her face calm. Everyone stay put. Delaney and King with me to the bridge. Larson, come with us as soon as you can. She punched the button to open the shuttle as soon as the light flashed green and made her way across the bay at a dead sprint. By the time they emerged onto the bridge, all of them were panting. Walker saluted at the duty officer and took her place at the control table as he melted away. She nodded to the pilot. Mike for Earth. The woman pivoted in her chair. Ma'am? King's jaw dropped open. Admiral, Delaney began, his voice was tight. What other option do we have? Walker looked over at him. They know about us now. They came to fight us. We don't have the fuel to run anywhere else, and we don't even know if we could outrun them. She made a calculation in her head. It was time for specifics now. Tell Washington and the Pele to hold them off, and get the rest of the fleet to Earth. She said a silent goodbye to Brown and Kim, and straightened her shoulders. There was only ever the best choice. We have to be there when the defense grid goes down. Now it was all up to Pike to find, and figure out how to use, the dawning. Chapter 13 Jupiter Ganymede's L4 Lagrange Point Fighter Bay, New Beginning Station Mechanics were yelling, pilots were sprinting between the ships, and the deck chief slammed Eric Barker's windshield closed so hard it bounced up again. Hey! Barker grabbed it and hauled it down. Don't get me killed! The chief didn't seem to hear him. The man barely stayed to make sure the shield was in place before he was off the ladder and hauling it to the next fighter. The robotic tug dragged Barker's ship into the airlock chamber, and he looked around to see who was assembled. They would be the second group out. Two wings were already flying, and Barker's crew had just been coming off duty when the klaxons sounded. What's the word, Woof? Whiskey, one of the older members of the team, leaned to catch his eye as she slid into her cockpit. The ship's engines were beginning to flicker to life as the tugs zoomed away and the back of the bay. 
A heavy door burned black with the fire of a thousand launches came down. Bastards found us, that's all I know. Barker ran through the ready checks, his fingers shaking. He'd flown hundreds of patrols, had even seen Telestine carriers and fighters drifting nearby. But he'd never engaged. No one had ever engaged before. Unless you believed that ridiculous story about the Valiant launching an attack on Earth. He didn't. And we're supposed to... take them down? Whiskey's wingmate seemed as uncertain as Barker was himself. That's why we make the big money, boys. The red lights began to flash, signaling decompression. All right, team, get your ships ready to fly and listen up. A chorus of eyes came back down the line. The thuggers found us. I don't know how, but you know how important it is that the fleet gets out of here. We don't. There's no rebellion anymore, capiche? He waited for the agreement. Our goal is to take out any of the fighters heading for the capital ships. They're pushing off now, and they'll go to drift around the edge of the planet and get out of sight of the Telestines. We'll keep the bastards occupied here and meet up with them at the rendezvous point. There better be one close rendezvous point. That was Whiskey. He could see her raising her eyebrows skeptically. He didn't respond as the door opened and the fighters sped out into the black, falling into a wedge behind him. Truth be told, he wondered the same thing himself. If their ships left them, they'd have no cover from the cannons, and they didn't have the inertial dampeners to match the acceleration the capital ships could pull, or the fuel to get out into any of the three dark spots humanity had found. Dead zones in the Telestine surveillance. He hoped there were more than three. Right now we focus on the mission. His voice was curt. Thanks, starboard and go down. We'll come up from under the Pele. They obeyed without a word, and he felt their fear thrumming in the air. Don't know about you, but I'm glad to be taking a shot after all this. He tried to keep his voice light. Whiskey thankfully picked up the lead. How many times we seen them go by? Man, I was tempted. Bang, bang, fuggers. Now we get to shoot back, eh? The chatter began. Nervous jokes between the pilots. And then they came up from under the ship, and the chatter stopped. He'd seen Telestine carriers. Of course he had. If you lived on a station and you looked out, you were bound to see one eventually. They wanted humans to see them, after all. The things were made to look imposing. A regular reminder of just how outmatched humanity was. To remind us of our place. And he'd only ever seen them from a distance, silhouetted against the red-orange bulk of Jupiter or drifting out in space. Up close, they took your breath away. Three carriers loomed over them, impossibly large. Next to them, New Beginning Station looked like a shoddy, battered little toy. The Pele was even smaller than that, for all that it dwarfed the fighters, and the Washington, beside them, was one of the smallest capital ships they had. The rest of the fleet was gone. That was when he understood, and from the silence on the line, he realized that the others knew too. He and his pilots were the sacrificial lambs, the ones who stayed behind while Walker drove the getaway car. Damn her. And God bless her. Fugger formation to port. Was that his voice? It didn't sound like it. He wasn't even aware that he'd been tracking the progress of the Telestine ships, but it seemed that his body was continuing on as if there was any point at all. There was a point. Purpose came back in a rush, and he turned his head to look at the distant specks of silver against the heavy curve of the planet. The fighters cut between them, roaring overhead, and Barker forced himself to replace the hollow punch of betrayal with something more, something different. What had he said? The day he told his parents he was leaving Johnson Station for the rebellion? Getting Earth back is worth more than any single one of us. They'd been listening to the Secretary General's speech, he remembered. It was that speech reminding them to follow the laws of the treaty, to not rock the boat that had caused something to snap inside him. If we stay like this, out in the black, we'll all die. He'd already been as good as dead the moment he was born on one of those stations. Like hell, he was going to let death scare him now. And that boat? It wasn't going to rock it. He was going to crash it. The Secretary General could go to hell. You all see the intrepid over there? He knew his voice was shaking. He was doing the best he could. He could feel his hands moving like he was in a dream, riding the ship and taking preliminary aim at the Telestine formation in their sights. Whiskey picked up the lead again. Yeah, chief, we see it. That ship has the admiral on it. 
He banked hard to port and slammed into high acceleration, sucked back in his chair as their formation shot toward the Telestine ships. She's going for Earth. Maybe not today, but someday. You heard about that mission they launched a few days back? Well, that was just the first piece. Admiral Walker's going to take back Earth someday, and we're going to make sure she survives long enough to do that. There was a long pause, and he blinked rapidly. His vision was blurring. Hi, Chief, Whiskey said softly. Let's teach these bastards a lesson. The eyes trickled in, some voices shaking, others numb. The shooting started, tiny bursts of warm fire in the darkness and cold, and the formation swerved loosely to get out of the way. But defense wasn't enough, and those eyes weren't good enough either. So what are we gonna do? Nothing. They were avoiding fire, but there was no life in them. Shit. They were going to die, and there wasn't going to be any point to it. The alien formation was coming up, and Barker let loose a stream of bullets. He held his breath as they were lost in the black, and then the Telestine fighter at the front of the wedge burst into a hundred shards of silver. I said, what are we gonna do? Fuck him up. The shout came back, hoarse from Fighter 8. What are we gonna do? He pounded on his windshield for emphasis. Fuck him up! The whole wing yelled the response back at him. Hell yeah, we are. All fighters engage. Let's make them sorry they found us. The roar of their approval was deafening. The formation split into four pieces, and Barker yanked on the yoke to take his group straight up. A formation of Telestines coming in hard to pick off the human fighters from above scattered in confusion, and Barker heard his wild laugh echoing over the comm lines. You like that? Almost beside him, one of the Telestine ships shattered and spun. He had time to see the fracture, a white cockpit, and his ship was already past the lost fighter as Whiskey gave a yell of satisfaction. They came up and around in a tight arc to dive down on the Telestines. They're coming around, said Fighter Five. Not fast enough. Get them before they can get us in their sights. His fingers closed around the trigger. He hissed in disappointment when one of the Telestines swerved out of the way of his bullets. Chief. It was whiskey, uncharacteristically quiet as they wove through the chaos outside. Sack, come here, you fucker. Another burst of rounds and the Telestine swerved again. Come on, almost got you. Yes! He pumped his fist in the air. He was still grinning as he flipped the switch for a private channel to whiskey, fighter two. What is it? The Washington. Her voice was soft, aching. Whiskey was fiery, gray streaking her brown hair, but she could drink any one of them under the table and she told the dirtiest jokes he'd ever heard. Ace pilot, he'd said it a hundred times. She'd turned down the role of CAG at least twice. Now all that was left of the whiskey he knew was the aim with which she took down one Telestine, and another, and another. She looked over at him, a tiny figure in her fighter, and then looked beyond. He knew what he would see, but he followed her gaze anyway, and the sight was like a blow. He swayed sideways as the ships banked into another formation and the Washington came directly into view. It hung at an angle, slowly spinning, struggling to compensate for the engines that had been shot to hell on its starboard side. Cannon still fired, but the decks surrounding the gunnery showed gaping holes. Fire flickered in its windows, and its hull was streaked with black. Telestine fighters plunged toward the carrier and sped away as their bombs pierced her hull. It was a terrible thing to see. A beautiful ship, beautiful to him in any case. A rough jumble of parts, the effort of blind hope and hundreds of mechanics. Mobbed by fighters, dying by slow inches. Captain Kim didn't have a chance. The Washington was dying. He didn't give an order. He didn't have to. There was no going home to their ship anymore. And if there was one 